You better be listening to Sleezoids or I must break you. I don't care if you don't want to hear me. I'm going to play Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise. And at the end of each episode, along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. Next week, we are doing a classic Hollywood Western and then in true dudes rock fashion, doing it again in space so join the sleaze absolutely we also decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover patreon subscribers also get an honor shout out and two bonus episodes every single month which we are in our sixth or are we in our seventh year technically i don't know yeah. we've done six this years, is the seventh year i don't yeah i think that's how it's going maybe or i don't know if that's true or I not don't know the either. math uh <laughs> there's like 150 plus bonus episodes as well as our bonus transmission series where we talk about new release genre movies and jamie and i both did go and check out the new dune so we're going to be talking oh, about yeah. that at some point you can imagine over on the bonus transmission series so patreon.com slash lesoids podcast for anyone interested in all those bonus episodes and speaking of which we had quite a lot of people make the jump this week so i'm gonna give them their shout outs here we had joe sign up at five dollars a month we had coconut crab kevin uh sonko uh geez peters uh we had deebs uh upgrade from five dollars a month to ten dollars a month is going to be joining us for our monthly virtual screening which we try to do on the last thursday of every given month uh we had um bath just sign up for five dollars a month jason treffs uh swaggy mctrill great Sick. name uh frost 56619, we had Samuel Langstone, Bismula, Tim Vickers, Norman Torog Jr., Aaron Rosenblum, who actually signed up for an entire year of the show. There's a little bit of a discounted rate monthly if you sign up at the annual tiers, thanks to uh, Aaron. Actually, Robert Martin here also signed up at the annual tiers, thanks to both of you. Uh, we had Raphael Sips. Uh, we had the 100 Mega Shock. We had uh, Michael Bradley sign up. Chris, Judith, uh, Sizkaris, uh, Dustin Inn, Dustin Inn, Inn? Mm-hmm. and uh, Jacob Goosentine. Awesome. I can't absolutely. I, this is, once again, this is the Josh just mispronounces your name round. <laughs> Everyone absolutely roasts me for it every point. week. It's fine. It is. Uh, <laughs> but thanks to all of you folks. Hope you are enjoying all of those uh, bonus episodes. We appreciate that support a lot. Yes, thank you. Um, the other plug for the week, as always, is Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you were listening on either one of those platforms, and I see the stats, I can see you right now listening on both those platforms, give us a good old rating and review over there. It helps us climb the ranks and find new listeners. And the last plug, as always, is merch. If you like the poster art that based out of Toronto horror artist Trevor Henderson did for our show, you can get that put on basically anything that you can think of. And you freaks have thought of a lot of stuff. You guys have gotten notebooks, pillows, hoodies, coffee mugs. If if you're interested in that at all, the link is in the description of this episode as well as over at sleazoidspodcast.com. But that is it for the intro. Welcome back to another week. As always, I am your host, Josh Lewis, and joining me also, as always, my co-host, Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. I believe two weeks ago would have been the last time you folks over on the main feed would have heard from us, and we would have had special returning guest Eric Siska of the We Hate Movies podcast back on the show to do a double feature on the man, the myth, the mustache himself, Mr. Burt Reynolds. Yes. Uh, we did a neo-noir pulp double feature of his, um, including the uh, k- kind of grislier, sexier 1970s update on Philip 
Philip Marlowe uh, that wasn't the long goodbye and also came out in 1973 and also featured Morris the Cat. Yes. <laughs> and, that, and that film was Buzz Kulik's uh, Seamus um, from 1973, which had lots of great uh, Burt action in it. And we paired it with his charmingly weary turn as uh, novelist William Goldman's Las Vegas uh, for hire mercenary gambling addict in a film called Heat from 1986, which was like directed by six different directors. Burt Reynolds punched one of the directors in the face <laughs> until he retired. Oh, uh, and eventually that goes from being like a 70s character piece about a sad gambler and kind of becomes like a Death Wish sequel <laughs> for like 20 yeah. minutes or so. Featuring, it's a strange movie. Featuring an incredible <laughs> kill where a guy gets just uh, covered in gasoline and then you see one of of, like hit Burt Reynolds stunt double do the highest flying kick you've ever seen hitting a light causing the sparks to go onto the man like a and Hong then, Kong stunt oh, yeah it's yeah. wild and he just is <laughs> engulfed in flames it's hilarious and so entertaining I enjoyed it very much but and, and part of the appeal the is that a, a 50 year old Burt Reynolds could possibly have not have done that stunt by the <laughs> <Yeah>. way <laughs> the, the, oh man the angle you guys gotta go watch it it's very funny Yes, and Seamus also had the wildest opening to maybe like any movie we've ever seen, which is just <laughs> yeah. the Columbia logo smash cut to people just being flamethrower <laughs> during a heist. So oh, if man. you want to hear us break all that down with Eric, that was uh, two weeks ago over on the main feed. But actually that opening to Seamus actually kind of segued us perfectly into the bonus episode <laughs> last week where we talked about a different kind of movie star. There was a little bit less mustache, a little bit less giggling. Yes. Uh, we talked about the Sicilian legend, the stone faced Sicilian legend, Henry Silva. Um, and we specifically talked about his collaborations with the god of the mercilessly bleak and brutal Italian years of lead Pol- Polizio Tetsky film, Fernando de Leo. We did uh, hit their films, The Italian Connection from 1972. And the boss from 1973, both of which were, you know, kind of like mob hitman neo noirs and American vigilante sort of like cop revenge movies, but with just Italian grindhouse levels of vulgarity and violence, <laughs> including uh, an opening sequence in The Boss oh, where Henry beautiful. Silva just whips out a grenade launcher that looks like a sniper rifle yeah. and destroys about explodes about 10 Italian men watching a porno in a theater. Yeah, and and, and so quickly to, that they don't even have a reaction shot of the people. They're just burnt to a crisp, and then you move on. It's it's very... If you like watching dummies explode, if you like watching children dummies get run over by cars, <laughs> Italy in the 70s is what you were looking for. Man. Oh, my God. Yeah, we've seen so many children just get rocked uh, in Italian <laughs> films. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, but yeah, go check it out. <laughs> Yeah. So you haven't heard that episode that was over on the Patreon last week. Go back and go check it out. We had some fun. Burt Reynolds and Henry Silva. We've been in a mode. Now at some point we have to do what was it? It was called Sharky's Machine, yes, I think it was that's called. Both of them. Which is Yeah, that's Burt Reynolds and Henry Silva together. I don't know what the fuck that is, that's but that crazy. has to be powerful. <laughs> yeah, that's so. a lot of power. Yeah, but uh, moving on to this week, we have a very special returning guest making his sixth appearance Let's on go. the show. He is uh, an author and a filmmaker. He's made short films. He's written books. He's programmed films. He's clerked at the video store. He's been at your local library, perhaps. <laughs> and he is notorious for bringing on the most fucked up extreme <laughs> Asian, Asian cinema we talk about uh, in, yeah. in any given year. Love it. That guest is Perry Rowland. Perry, how you doing? Great. Thanks for having me back. Welcome. Welcome. I knew as yeah, soon as what, what Josh you... told me that Perry was coming on, I got very excited. <laughs> you bring on just the... Jamie was like, I'm, I'm going to watch something absolutely sickening yes. at some point. I love... Oh, yeah. God. I just... I love it every single time. And and I mean, it's... and I'll let you say it, but, but one of them I had seen before and I'm a big fan of, so it was awesome. Hell yeah. Well, it's always a pleasure. So Perry, Notorious, Tetsuo the Iron Man, Midori, Mermaid in a Manhole. There's a whole bunch of these. I think last time it was Evil Dead Trap and Celluloid Nightmares. <laughs> so what, uh, what, what pairing did you come up uh, with this week to show us some images we've maybe never seen before over on the continent of Asia? Um, well, it's interesting. When I first got this double feature idea, I thought, oh, I'm not really doing a horror movie this time. And then I rewatched one of the movies. And I was like, <laughs> 
Uh, so <laughs> this double feature is Boys Night. Uh, it's movies about hanging out with the guys. Yes. Uh, it's two crime movies, one of which is Gonin by the great Takashi Ishii, and the other is The Mission by Johnny Toe. Uh, so one from Japan, one from Hong Kong. Uh, one very expressionist and strange, one very controlled and, um, I mean, still very strange, but quite mannered in a way. Mm. Absolutely. And two groups of, you know, five guys hanging out. That was, that was the funniest thing I thought. I was like, dude, these both of these movies are 90s crime thrillers, but they're specifically about five gangster underground adjacent mm. guys who team <laughs> up to do a job. Like it, literally it's the exact same number. And I, I mean, one of them was almost what was Gonin was was called the five or yeah, something yeah, like that. Gonin like a, translates to like five people, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 and, and they both they, they both do a job. One just goes horribly ruthlessly wrong, and the <laughs> other one, despite some hitches, uh, friendship kind of prevails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, <laughs> going uh, definitely. It, it, what I liked about both of them is that they have that kind of hangout quality, and they spend a lot of time just really, literally hanging out with each other. Um, but yeah, going in really takes a turn eventually. <laughs> I gotta say, <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting into the details. Yeah. But yeah, both are also, you know, really expertly directed. Both have, you know, very Absolutely. different tones to them. Both have strong visual focus, I thought, on kind of like the architectural environments around Absolutely. these uh, career criminals, the way that they shoot the city and the angles. Mm -hmm. And both are very um, interested uh, thematically in kind of the the social and power hi hierarchy and the relationship between those who, you know, actually have power and money and who give out the orders and the guys who actually kind of have to do the labor of it and maybe suffer the consequences of it below them. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so we're going over to Japan. We're going over to Hong Kong, and yeah, hanging out with two directors. I uh, Takashi uh, Ishii. I've never seen it. I had never seen anything um, directed by him before. Yeah, but Johnny Toe, one of my just absolute favorite, um, like still working Hong Kong filmmakers. He is uh, uh, just unbelievable, and he has such a rich catalog, which we'll get into why. But he's like so prolific. The dude mm -hmm. shoots like two movies a year. I'll never catch up. <laughs> <laughs> I've done like seventeen of his movies, and I. I still have like 10 incredibly popular ones to go. <laughs> That's yeah. wild. I was thinking so. earlier, like, oh, I haven't seen that many Giant Toe movies. And that's still true, but then I realized I've seen, like, 12 of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, had, I, had that, I had that same realization the other day. I was like, wow, I still have so many left to go on his list. And I looked, I was like, is that right, 17? <laughs> there's, some, <laughs> there's some people who never made 17 films <laughs> no, <laughs> that are way, way more, more, more famous. So I don't know. And it's it's very interesting. Like, at least the ones that I've seen. So. Very true, too. So, but yeah, that being said, I think we are going to jump right into it. We're going to kick, uh, kick things off here. We're going to go chronologically uh, and we're going to talk about Gonin. All right, we are talking Gonin, a.k.a. The Five, the 1995 Japanese Yakuza crime film written and directed by Takashi Ishii, uh, starring Koichi Saito, Masahiro Motoki, Naoto Takanaka, uh, among many, many others, uh, and also including in a killer supporting role the god of the moody japanese crime film yes. uh himself from the 1990s takeshi kitano okay. uh, which we will talk about very excitedly when we get to his appearance about midway through the film or so but this is actually is our second time on the show talking about uh takashi ishii uh not just um uh, on the show either, but also a second time with Perry, uh, who actually last brought him on a year ago via the script that he wrote for Toshiharu Ikeda's uh, Evil Dead Trap, which was mm. just this very unpredictable and unsettling you know, mix of J-horror and slashers and Argento and Fulci and just gory nightmare logic and erotic, 
you know, uh, Pinku elements and extreme cinema elements, fucking snuff video stuff got into it. We were, we compared some of the, the colors to Giallo and some of the crazy floating, lurching cameras to like Raimi. Um, but, but, but Perry, for anyone who maybe didn't listen to that episode, uh, what broadly was, uh, Takashi, uh, Ishii's, uh, deal prior to, um, Gonin, because I, I do remember briefly bringing up that he was like a manga artist and he did yeah. the Angel Gut series, that kind of stuff, mm. right? Uh, Takashi Ishii was one of the godfathers of, well, I guess you'd say, like modern erotic manga. Uh, the oh. Angel Gut series is the most infamous, uh, which are, you know, SM tinged, dark. That's such a crazy stories. thing to be famous for. Yeah. You, well, yeah. He, he was sort of, um, he was one of the first. To, to draw that style of manga, you know, and the Angel Gut series got adapted into a series of pink films uh, for Nikatsu. And he wrote most of them, I believe. Uh, he ended up directing one of them after he uh, took the jump into being a director. And as a director, he mostly made either pink films like two of the Angel Guts movies, Red Vertigo and Red Lightning. Uh, or he did the remake of Flower and Snake, which is a pretty uh, infamous 70s Roman porno movie. Uh, and he made a movie called like Sweet Whip towards the end of his career. So movies with that sort of tenor. And his other mode was very stylized, very nasty neo-noir. Uh, and that's movies Hell like yeah. A Night in Nude, um, Black Angel... Uh, and most infamously, the Gonin trilogy, uh, specifically the first Gonin. Okay. Yeah. Well, because Gonin, I mean, like, it, I think that's a, a good place to like kind of help people gather their sort of way into the film because I think when people start watching this film, they're going to think it's a very different film than it is. Mm -hmm. It's like it's very deceptive in that it's you know it's made by a guy who was famous for you know doing this more sort of uh, graphic and, and extreme uh, kind of al almost horror esque um, stylizing at times mm -hmm. and making his way into the crime movie. And so you know I, he actually you can tell that he kind of has some reverence for just the actual crime movie like when it starts i was like oh this is just like a really cool slick like yeah. you know yakuza heist thriller it's you know the neon city stylizing even the way that he kind of walks you through some of the sort of eccentric sort of crime character archetypes that kind mm -hmm. of pop up throughout the film obviously around the mid midway point there's like a, just a really really well directed and controlled like robbery sequence which obviously has a little bit of chaos and mania to it due to the characters but like the filmmaking is clean mm -hmm. and the filmmaking yeah. is not like you know it's 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 not psychotic until yeah. at a, around a certain point it, it the, i would describe this movie as uh the opposite of a fun heist movie <laughs> whatever the polar opposite of that is whatever like you were like oh, i was kind of having fun hanging out with these characters and then you're like oh my god turn it off you're fucking yeah you know, the boys you know, you're george c scott and hardcore the boys yeah. lose the friendship in this one it seems and lose themselves a lot <laughs> it, 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 gets, it becomes so nasty oh, yeah, and scenes of torture and execution and just corpses and just a general like suicidal despair kind of just like takes over the movie <laughs> at a yeah, certain a whole, point to an almost operatic degree yeah, and and you know we'll get to everything but it's it's it ends up being just this doomed story really that that mm -hmm. really no one gets out of at the end of the day it's it's kind of, it's absolutely bleak um and yeah. and, and still again because I, I said it in the intro he but he still takes the time to get to know these characters which makes it so much more just uh, harrowing when it does actually happen and starts unfolding into the whole doomed quality of it. Um, Very sad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, but yeah, like him, he's... him waking up with the flashes of nightlife and you know seeing the that that man being beaten in the alleyway, but there's kind of like a, a spotlight over it. it. It feels very much like a, a crime film at the, in the in the beginning. Yeah, Ishii's other crime films. Um, I don't want to say they're more traditional because they're all Takashi Ishii movies. But you can tell, like, he's not a, a tourist in noir. Like, he really, mm. really loves uh, the tropes of the genre. I mean, every character in Gonin is, like, a, a different classic type noir guy. You have the ex-cop. You have the boxer. <laughs> you have the club owner. Um, 
or his all, movies. They're all here, yeah, all, all the here. stars. Uh, his movie, <laughs> a, a Night in Nude, which is I I'd say more traditional, but kind of just as extreme. Uh, centers around like a, a sort of private eye character, uh, a guy who can be hired to he'll do anything for the money, you know. So he he loves noir, but just the way he approaches it is through the lens of this very um, graphic expressionist. Mm -hmm. His stuff is just so... It, not only are all the characters in his movies doomed, but they're just so, like, colorfully doomed. He's so, <laughs> he's so yeah. obsessed with their doom. Um, yeah. I like, totally, I totally see that. Well, and, and, and I think around this time too, I feel like with in, in Japanese crime cinema specifically, like people really did feel open to experimentation. Like I think mm -hmm. about the fact that they, they got Takeshi Kitano for this film too, mm -hmm. who is maybe the other d director we've talked about sort of in this kind of specific, um, period because, but, but, but what's sort of different and which I almost com compare even maybe closer to Johnny toe is that there's, there's kind of a, a patience and a minimalism and kind of a solitude, something beautifully tranquil about mm -hmm. the sort of like Katano style of composition and editing and how romantic and expressive the, you know, Joe, uh, has she like music is the composer for Miyazaki. And, but, but the one thing that I found sort of similar is just how willing they were around this time to just interrupt all of those qualities that you would kind of expect in a more typical genre film mm -hmm. and be kind of sudden and shocking and, mm -hmm. and really bluntly um, violent with, with some of the characters and w with Katana, we did a uh, violent cop, which was like his mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, bad Lieutenant or point blank kind of style film uh, where, where the violence is so root routine to him on a daily basis that it just becomes some, it almost becomes mundane. Yeah. you know to, to it even the consequences and then sonatine was uh maybe a little oh. bit closer and where it was like half gangster beach vacation hangout movie <laughs> where the characters kind of like fantasize and dream about escaping to somewhere else and then it was the other half was like harrowing the harrowing reality of how killing for money basically just like poisons your soul mm -hmm. and your environment and you know the only escape is uh, uh maybe one of the most famous uh, suicide shots <laughs> in movie history yeah oh my god <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a post Katana movie, specifically post Violent Cop. Um, it has the same cinematographer as Violent Cop. Uh, That's true uh, too. Yasushi Sasakibara, and there are scenes in this movie that echo images in Violent Cop. Uh, I'd say one of the first really shocking bits of violence in this movie involves a stray bullet. Uh, a, a man is trying to shoot someone in a fight. The gun is moved, and then the bullet and it hits, hits a, a woman. woman. It hits a Just, woman, yeah. which is something that happens in Violent Cop as well. Mm. One of the and, cra in, in Violent Cop too, when that woman just gets because she gets like headshot right yeah. too on the side, and I remember that moment really freaked me out in Violent Cop with just how just matter of fact it was like just mm -hmm. this horrible thing that someone else would play up for complete horror. And you're totally right. This is, it's, it's the same deal in this, except for they add the agonizing detail <laughs> that for the rest of that scene, yep. you can just hear that woman screaming in the background yes. that she that got shot in the say. leg. She didn't die. Exactly. She got shot in the leg. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like, yeah. They're, they're just spending, they're still c like in the conflict really. Uh, but the entire yeah. time, even as they're fighting, as they're arguing, whatever it is, she's just like screaming. Uh, it, it's yeah. a unbelievable detail. I, I'd say Katano's movies are violent. His gangster movies are violent, but, uh, Takashi Ishii's crime movies are grotesque. You know, he really <laughs> yes. plays up the violence in a, in a way that's not, it's as stylized as Katano, but not quite as, um, you can't distance yourself from it in the same way. It's yeah. No, he, he, he definitely really, really um, hits you with it, which I which 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 is something that I think does lead to some visceral impact, although I will say at a certain point, if it, 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 it became so uh, weighty and kind of heavy by the second half that I, I don't I wouldn't say it became monotonous, but it, it became like, what else could you do to these people? man? Yeah. <laughs> Are you like, how, how do you keep coming up with more shit to do to these people? Yeah. <laughs> you need to stop, <laughs> you, need, yeah. you know, and, yeah, uh, cool. and, and he, he does kind of revel in, in, in some of the um, horror aspects, uh, especially later on. But I, but I do like that in the early goings that there, you know, there's some heightened sort of stylistic choices that are putting you in the headspace um, mm -hmm. specifically, though, of these very just disgruntled and kind of frustrated 
characters, primarily yeah. this disco nightclub owner, uh, Mikahiku Bandai, played by Koichi Sato, uh, previously talked about from the Golden Pavilion segment in Paul Schrader's Mishima, yeah. um, and uh, who were introduced to in like, as what Jamie was referring to, the sort of like sort of dream nightmare sequence he has where he's in this kind of perpetual state of like night sweats. And I, I love the detail about the metronomic sort of like baseball bat violence that kind of mm. hits the, um, mm. so the, the sound design for a little bit. And his world is kind of just filled with the general noise of the wet kind of rain drenched city streets, which I'll say the rain photography in this and the city oh. photography in this kind of blew my mind. The dwarfing sort of like metal and concrete sort of like architectural surroundings, the way they, they're just surrounded by it or like the lights of his club and the use of wide angle lenses and these unusually low and high sort of like angle choices. Yeah. It's just, you know, something is disorienting and discomforting and kind of off about this world. And it does feel primed for kind of violence in a way. And we don't really totally understand why you just kind of have a feeling. And we eventually do find out why that, because despite his sort of superficially wealthy appearance, he actually owes a lot of money to the um, violently impulsive uh, Yakuza who frequent and kind of disrupt um, his his clubs and to show how brutal they are is that moment where the uh, the, the the hustler character shows up and tries to stop one of the guards I think from from uh, taking uh, from you know getting into violence with him and the yakuza attempts to execute that guy and one of the you know one of the guards has to come up and say dude you can't just fucking like ex shoot a dude in the middle of the club and then it hits the girl's leg and uh, she's screaming yeah. and you know they're all all of that kind of kind of stuff which i i also want to say too um the distinction between like where the yakuza hang out and where like he hangs out is so funny because like there's something so wet and grimy about like the streets he has to operate in mm -hmm. meanwhile the yakuza like when that scene where they humiliate him later it's in like this fluorescent lit office where yeah. you know they're they're to totally respect you know this is where the real business uh happens like there's been an, a complete change in the japanese economy that has resulted in you know all of these various kind of weirdos and losers who have all been sort of economically put upon by the bubble bursting mm -hmm. and they might have been formerly respectable members of society like you know sort of office workers or cops or something but now they are all the underdogs seeking to kind of subvert this power hierarchy and we'll, we'll go through them but he meets yeah. a bunch of characters yeah yeah it's a it's a motley crew because besides bondi the first person he meets is a, a very fascinating salary man uh, yes. Uh, named Ogiwara. And it's like basically the second scene in the movie is Bandai is trying to uh, basically work out his aggression at the batting cage. He's just swinging wildly. He's drinking a beer. And his, all of his, them. Yeah, you know, <laughs> his cell phone rings and he uh, does not pick it up immediately. And this other guy down the batting cage, uh, Ogiwara, is like, hey, you should go pick up your phone. And Bandai tells him to fuck off, and then one thing leads to another, and Ogiwara is following him out into the parking lot, trying to beat him with the baseball bat. Uh, <laughs> and that's kind of Ogiwara's deal. I mean, he has more going on that we'll discuss later, but he's oh, yeah. just like the very impulsive, strange, deadly one. Like he kind of also the his actor route that the movie was written for, which I thought was crazy because that actor is Naoto uh, Takanake uh, yes. from Shinya Sukamoto's Tokyo Fist, and right. I, I think Perry, you you linked the uh, commentary track. Someone had translated the commentary track for this movie because there's not a whole lot that you can find out written about it. And in that was where they revealed that the movie was at, he actually got the the ball rolling on it because he said, "Dude, I've always wanted to be in like a Reservoir Dogs kind of movie, you know." <laughs> and so <laughs> that's awesome. And so, bam, this movie was written <laughs> in yeah, such a funny way he got to pick which character he wanted to be too he got first picking and <laughs> he's, he's like, like oh i want to be this guy let me which, swing the bat uh, i mean around. respect that's I awesome. would not want to be this guy, but you know. <laughs> I would not no. want to do the scene he has to do around the middle point yes. of this movie. So <laughs> uh, another person who joins the crew is the hustler uh, Mitsuya, who is worth knowing is one of the movie's many gay characters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of surprising that you have you know like a a, a group of men movie where they sort of make the homoeroticism explicit, mm -hmm. uh, especially between Mitsuya and Bandai. 
Uh, Absolutely. Mitsuya joins in. We've talked about it so many times yeah. where like there's so much homoerotic energy and like this is the movie where they were like, yeah, there is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the first We're not going to stop at energy. <laughs> the first scene where Bondi brings Mitsuya back to his apartment. And Mitsuya, by the way, at the start of the movie, has this amazing like visual K psycho look where he has this long wig and like purple lipstick and this really flashy suit. And he's doing like weird. And, 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 and he specifically says the, that he does that because he's like, I I try to pick up wealthy gay men and then blackmail them yeah. to their wives or whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then he, he, it's like this really long take. Which another thing, Takashi Ishii loves his long takes. There are a lot of pretty uh, nimble ones in this movie, and mm-hmm. one of the first big ones is this this two hander scene with him and Bondi where. They're talking and he just starts undressing in Bondi's living room and then like sneaks around to his shower and like sticks a leg out from a curtain and <laughs> he, he spends the entire movie. Uh, I love that the happy. opening framing of that shot too looks like that uh, that shot where Barry Pepper and Philip Seymour Hoffman are talking in 25th hour and you can see like ground zero outside like the window. It's like, you know, the, mm-hmm. his like lavish apartment is lit normally and then the outside world just kind of, it almost looks a little alien. So yeah, it's some yeah. cool filmmaking. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because the way... Uh, Masahiro Motoki plays Mitsuya is he starts in this like very theatrical again like almost like a visual K persona where he's doing all these crazy poses he's being yeah I was surprised I hadn't seen him in anything before but I I get yeah I I, I guess his his big thing prior to this was that he was in uh he was actually in like a boy band that was like his his yeah. big claim to fame and then and then he did a, a bunch of dramas by the look yeah. of it but i was well, like yeah he's he get he gets a, a lot to do in this film and i uh, think he does it well he's also the lead in shin sukamoto's gemini uh which oh, is a, a pretty seen that, fantastic actually. strange yeah he plays two roles he plays twins oh cool uh, we love that <laughs> and it's a it's a very bizarre i mean it's a shin sukamoto movie so you know it's graphic and all sorts does of, he also uh, sexually, whip out a switchblade uh I know, but he hit him with a big stick. I remember that's and there good was a POV too. shot that's of him falling down a as well. As long as he got that's some kind scary. of cool weapon, I'm in. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. As the the movie goes on, his performance ends up being kind of the the beating heart of the movie. Yeah, which I found absolutely. interesting. Yeah, it becomes more uh, and more grounded. Like he's playing mm-hmm. less of a this this character. He's kind of portraying in the beginning, uh, and mm-hmm. just kind of gets more. Um, it's just it, it feels like he's more honest as it as it goes on in, in a sense. Uh, and it's one, he's getting really invested in this sort of this group yeah. and sort of like this relationship and, that he's striking. And it's just it's a bad time to finally decide that you're going to go straight and become yourself. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, then there's a uh, Hizu. By Jim yes, the discredited strongman ex cop who yes. loves to pick on the weak, and you know, you like you used to uh, stake out the, uh, the 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 nightclub that our uh, main Bandai uh, ran, but has since you know become become part of the uh, sort of gutter community as mm-hmm. as well here, and played by Jin Jin Pachi Nezu from Akira Kurosawa's Ran, which I thought was cool. Yeah, he he has a interesting role in the movie in that his character is kind of the only one who really knows how to pull off a crime or seems to have any idea what it might entail. Um, Because eventually all the guys link up and of course they have to plan a heist on the Yakuza. Uh, And he's the only person in the team who seems to be able to keep a a cool head through the proceedings. Mm -hmm. Especially in scenes where he's playing off of Ogiwara or Mitsuya. Yeah, well, I mean, or or shit. I mean, the the last guy is this blonde haired sort of like drug addicted pimp who's very yeah. good at fighting, yes. but they are kind of like, man, he seems like you know he seems a little unhinged, and I mean, even the salary man seems a little unhinged. Everyone seems like a little down on their luck and a little desperate and a little like sort of like a, a cornered animal kind yeah. of vibe. Whereas right. he's is the one who has a little bit. I mean, he's in similar situations, but he's like, I've I've been in this kind of position before, and mm-hmm. I know how to you know, kind of push my way through. And yeah, I do like that, you know, all of these characters meet one another and they just, they do what all guys do when five guys get into a room. They're like, 
have you ever wanted to do a heist? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. I'm in. <laughs> don't, don't even need to hear the plan. They don't even really come up with much of a plan. <laughs> they just decide to do it. <laughs> they have the, the heist they pull off is one of the most like slipshod, you know, 99 cent <laughs> store heist idea of all time. Yeah, it's really just. Yeah, they like, were like, what if one guy and... doesn't even wear a mask and he's on camera <laughs> and they just later hunt that guy down for information? I was like, come on, guys, what are we doing here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I do love like when you get to it, it is shot still very cool and exciting and, and, and very thrilling, like him oh, jumping over stylized. the table and running across it and everything. But then it, the rest that's of it is a it's huge just a, table, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, Jesus that's Christ. The, and, but the rest of it is just so messy, really, at the end of the day. Uh, and it's well, it's fun that it's still kind of stylized in that way of, of, of an action scene. But, you know... It, it still has that chaos that it needs to because well, and how impulsive it is to be like we're not even going to start with like robbing a convenience store. It's like no, we're going to rob the yakuza to pay <laughs> yeah, them the back. Yeah, yeah, it's like that's like the that's risk. You know, thing that the you people who are going to be the least forgiving people. If you were to maybe you know, if your plan was to be a little impromptu and like a little hasty yeah. and amateur, you know. You know, you can get away with that with with certain kinds of people that you're going to rob. And it's just these, you know, these were not the guys that were going to let you get away with that. But despite how chaotic like their actual plan is, I do like how, you know, it it, it does feel very controlled in its filmmaking. Like it's yes. a very oh, tense absolutely. sequence, the action thriller, like the, the, the his camera zooms and spins. Yes. And, even the, uh, the 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 Dutch angle sort of like dance moves it sometimes does around like knife thrusts or like a gun barrel being pointed down the lens and yeah it's it's really well done. Takashi yeah. Ishii, I already called him a graphic filmmaker and I guess I'm going to use it in the other term now or the other sense of graphic as like he's a graphic artist he's a he's a mangaka and he mm -hmm. has a good eye for how to how to just frame something in a dynamic way. Um, the way guns are shot in this movie are crazy. Uh, there's yep. a bit where it does like the Michael Mann gun barrel shot, but then the guy moves the yes. gun and the camera tracks with it. Um, yep. There, the you mentioned the zooms. There's great use of like slow zooms and bits of tension, and then these really scary crash zooms, uh, especially yeah. in the second half when someone sort of appears unexpectedly. Uh, there are a couple strange like POV shots. I remember there's a bit where um, uh, Hizu and Mitsuya are like fighting when they first meet up at the at the disco after dark, um, and Hizu does like a like a jujitsu takedown on Mitsuya. Oh yeah, and, like and, a and the camera shot. like spins with yeah. him, like flipping mm -hmm. him. Right? Yeah, it's so yeah, good. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> I mean, one of the first bits of the movie uh that the sort of nightmare sequence mentioned earlier it has this incredible like st step frame slow-mo shot of bondi opening his eyes which then does like a, a dissolve into uh, like the camera circling down on a tiled ground and then a hand reaching in and picking up this wallet and then the camera moves back and you see like the person picking it up and yeah it's he has all these incredibly stylized shot ideas Mm -hmm. And it's just linking one to another to another to another. I mean, there's not really a boring shot in this movie. Yeah, he, he's got a great um, sense of like how he uses the space. So another awesome scene mm -hmm. I loved is when they're, I think it's Bundai and he goes to uh, the place where all of the sex workers are. And he's mm -hmm. like hiring a woman uh, for part of the job. And, and all of a sudden, all the cops start to swarm them. And so he's yes. like trying to get through some type of exit or opening so that he can escape with her. And the camera pretty much just like follows them behind them in these really narrow alleyways as he's going through like small doorways and stuff to, to just try to escape. And um, I loved that sequence as well. I thought it was great. Yeah. It's, it's another one of his, you know, really intense long takes mm -hmm. and along with, you know, his sort of uh, exaggerated framing, he just has such a thick atmosphere in his crime movies. I mean, the colors in this movie are nuts. There's neon yeah. colors, yep. neon lights of like every color. You know, it's like a, a Refn movie or something. You have these big reds and blues and greens and purples. Uh, there's like near yeah. constant, but also rain incredible and shadows oh, and yeah. yeah, the wetness and rain just throughout. Uh, incredible. There's a there's a great shot of Bondi walking into a hallway where you just see his shadow against like a pure red lit wall. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. And it's interesting because it's like 
the universe this movie is just this fully stylized pulp fantasy, you know. You can't imagine people living a regular life in the Shinjuku and Gonin. Yeah, well, well, and, and that's what makes it interesting. And th- th- it, it makes me believe that that's why these guys were maybe so confident that they mm-hmm. were just like, we could, we could, you know, that's this, this world is like one where, you know, the, the we're the, the good guys who have been put upon and we're going to do the heist and we're going to take the money back and we're going to get away with it. And briefly, they do actually pull the heist off, you know, like they, yes. it's, it's a little bit uh rushed and a little bit you know uh uh it doesn't go all according to plan but they do eventually uh m- make their way out and uh for bandai he even puts on like a bit of a show for them where he's mm-hmm. like oh they were actually robbing me too or they were actually like hitting me during the fi- during the altercation and everything and you know so he's like not even suspected of being involved i think they just take one of his fingers just for being mm-hmm. an annoyance so they were like you know whatever we didn't kill him mm-hmm yeah, but unfortunately, and, somehow none of them figured out that they they needed to uh, take the that they had to use the one guy to go up to the security camera and show his face on the security camera to be like, hey, let me in. And all of those robbers came in after yeah. that. And so they immediately yeah. it's 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 actually absurd how fast, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's just like 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 like. Like Bondi is just like listening to like uh, like opera music on (laughs) on his audio system and it is it is club and instantly you could just see and and I I do like that there's like some attention paid to the character work so that the cruelty doesn't feel just like entirely like this like mechanical interlocking Mm -hmm. thing that just happens it feels more like painful that these characters are locked into kind of like a vice grip that's that's tightening as as the the second half of the movie yeah. really kicks off and it really does kind of become a, a horror film yeah, well, but uh, i was just gonna say oh, go it's also jimmy the uh the the pimp uh yes. he was also trying he was also trying to take uh because the, he works for the yakuza and so the yakuza have the passports of everyone who he traffics you know and he's trying to take the passport of uh, this Nami, woman he fell right? in love with, Nami. Yeah, uh, Nami, which by the way is a name that appears in I believe every Takashi Ishii movie. He always has like an important woman named Nami in it. I was gonna uh, say because yeah. it's also the name of the uh, reporter in uh, Evil Dead Trap. Actually. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's named the Angel Gods characters too. And um, Dang. yeah, so. But he takes her passport Some too. So the, broke broke his heart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so th- th- he's on camera. He has all this like specific personalized evidence was stolen along with ten million yen, and yeah. Yeah, they, they well, grab well, and, well, and, and, and he gets caught, too, because he goes, look, so I, I got this passport and money and now you can leave. But it's too dangerous for me to go with you because they've seen my face. So you can just go by yourself. And, you know, she is obviously really upset about this and say, you know, you said that you were going to come with me, that this mm-hmm. was like, a you know, we were going to do this together. And she starts treating him again like a sort of transactional relationship which actually makes him you know really upset that she just starts acting sort of like a a sex worker instead of someone that he you know did Mm -hmm. this thing out of love for and she eventually does kind of you know get him to cave and be like you know we're we're no if we're escaping we're going to escape together which ends up obviously being a horribly tragic decision because they both just instantly are captured by the yakuza sort of hitman squad in this nightmarish slow dolly along this like wet subterranean like dungeon where on one side of the screen they screen they are torturing jimmy just in a chair completely bloody looking for information about who planned the job and on the right side of the frame as it slowly dolls over we can see that they are sexually assaulting and and murdering namie on the other side of the room and it just this shot is so long it's so icky. So it's slow. so completely inescapable and wet and the operatic music is playing. And I just, I went, what the fuck? Like, yeah. this was like the moment where I was like, yeah. oh, this is, this is a movie made by the guy who wrote evil dead trap. Yeah. <laughs> like, here it is. It, now it's, the, it takes its, its full it transition. And, uh, along with the, the tone turn, I mean, I, I'd say the, the, the change in tones kind of solidified when, uh, Jimmy manages to escape his bonds and he fights his way back to the Yakuza office. 
and he comes in wearing Nami's clothes and wearing her scalp. Uh, and he's completely yeah. bloody. Yeah. There's this really grotesque. That's a detail Takeshi Kitano wouldn't put in there, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank God we got Takashi Ishii. <laughs> did he did he need yeah. to scalp the woman he yeah. loved and wear her yeah. while he was trying to get his revenge that he doesn't end up getting he's because he just gets viciously himself, shot to death and it's and it's done in this like freaky strobe cutting mm-hmm. where he gets completely uh, taken out and in this really stylized moment of the silhouetted hitman figure who shoots him yeah. down and then the lights slowly come up to reveal Takeshi Kitano in a fucking eye patch which looks sick but was also uh just actually a a a real life uh thing that happened to him i think most people who know takeshi kitano will know that he got in a pretty horrible motorcycle accident in 1993 and yeah he had to take a little bit of a break from movies and is is this his first movie back after this is his first movie back uh he signed a movie movie. to come back with yeah he's (laughs) awesome for that decision (laughs) he, he signed on before he had the accident and then after he had the accident, uh-huh. I think that like, the producers like tracked him down in Australia or something like he was recovering like, in Australia and like, Hey, come on. And so a lot of the, he was just chopping wood. They were like, dude, we're bringing yeah. you back. <laughs> uh, so the eye patch and then certain ways they get around him being in the rain in this movie because you don't want water getting under the bandage. Uh, oh, I didn't even think about that. That's why he has the umbrella. Yeah, that's, that's why so he has sick. this plastic umbrella in the movie. <laughs> and, it, and he looks great with it. He's just, he, it, he, that guy can make anything look. cool. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I got it. I wanted to mention one little sequence uh, right before that, the, the torture sequence, um, where it just has oh. them get off of the train. And then they, and then the camera just kind of follows them as it slowly reveals that the Yakuza is, is kind of uh, uh, coming up on them. And they have they actually take the time to just kind of stand there behind them as they're like purchasing a drink or something as they get onto the next train or whatever. And he on purposely fades it to black and then goes to the other two guys for a little while before going and doing that slow transition pan into uh, or tracking shot into the the torture sequence. So it's just like I, I thought that that whole series of editing and those shots were just so ominous and scary as well so yeah the the editing in this movie is very sharp yeah uh especially uh, the cross cutting between that and then uh the scene with uh bandai and mitsuya in the in the club mentioned listening to opera the way the atmosphere of the scenes with jimmy sort of curdles the scenes with yeah. bandai yeah. is really really good definitely yeah, well, and, it, well, and it, it does start you being like this is like a larger, almost like it, it, it has a, a very deliberate machine like this thing is now you've you've you know, you've hit a trap, you've hit a mm-hmm. trigger and all of a sudden this thing is coming for you mm-hmm. and they, yeah. they those characters don't know it yet. But like the atmosphere of the movie absolutely knows that like this crushing thing has just been activated yeah. and its face is goddamn Takeshi yeah. Kitano. If it's, there's ever been a stone faced <laughs> fucking killer on screen, like he's, he's just, it, he's got one of those, which, which is so funny because that's actually not his personality yeah. at all, but he just fucking, he looks the part so well, especially after his fucking accident where, you know, uh, for, for anyone, I, I think we briefly, we talked about it because he de- he wrestles with it a lot in in his film Hanabi, which is one of the more famous ones people might know him for. Um, because because his accident also gave him like partial face paralysis, right? Was mm-hmm. was part of the deal yeah. with it. So then he ob- obviously most people would be like, well, you know, I've lost an expressive tool, and for him was like, no, I'm just going to select my characters very carefully where a lack of expression being surrounded by things that people should be uh, reacting to is actually going to be part of the character. And in this case, as like the most ruthless serial killing Yakuza hired hitman of all time, um, it's uh, it, 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 it works out perfectly. And the second half of the movie, honestly, at a certain point just becomes a gruesome montage of each of these men being hunted down one by one and um, punished for you know their attempt to subvert this order of the yakuza economy and um the it and and ishii does play it up for just maximum brutality and uh tragedy um yeah. which w- we style. will have to get to with <laughs> yeah. the sickeningly extended long shot of the company man who comes home 
oh, man. which I think is maybe one of just the grimmest stretches of a crime movie I've ever seen and, and done in this, such a haunting, ghostly fashion where it, it's it's honestly, it, it, it how long it waits is so perverse to almost show you to what it is that it's going to show you, which is each and every one of his family members, his daughter, his wife, and his son, just already massacred and rotting in his house in very different sort of like image contexts, which we'll, which we'll, we'll, we'll mention, but like this whole sequence and the fact that it's just, it's so slow. And every time you think the scene's about to end or there's not a possibly another horrible image it could show you, it's like, just kidding. Here's another one. And it's going to keep going for minutes. And it's so unbearable that the character starts losing his mind and you completely understand. Yeah. Uh, Well, I want to say, I I think it's actually the implication is that he killed his family. See, I I was having both. I I was having a hard time deciphering. I kind of thought that, but then I but then I heard another character later in the movie say he was the one who did it. So I was a little confused about that. Uh, Well, because Katano, or or, or he's saying that he did it. Yeah, Katano and his uh, he he's he's an assassin in a duo with Kazuya Kitamura. Um, and they're, they're, yep. uh, they're gay hitmen is their gimmick basically. And, uh, <laughs> when they're going through the house after they kill Ogiwara, the salary man, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Kimura points out like, Hey, these corpses have really been rotting for a while. And you see too, when they confront, uh, Ogiwara, they find Ogiwara is sitting in the bathtub with the corpse of his wife who he sees as a lie. Horrible image. Uh, yeah. A really disgusting corpse. I should mention the special effects in this movie are by someone who worked on Tetsuo 2 and on, Body Hammer. Uh, on the aforementioned uh, Gemini, the Tsukamoto's. So it's, they look really I mean, the, the rotten corpses in the, this movie the are just The flies are worst. buzzing yeah. around. The fucking brain matter is on the wall. Yeah. His it's, children are just the palest, yeah. most bloated looking corpses. It's like, it's yeah. horrifying. Yeah, because the, the whole movie, you see this Ogiwara guy is kind of on the fringes of the group. And there's just something off about him. Like, he's very quick to violence. He keeps talking about his family that you never see him talk to or interact with. Um, true. He, he's the guy. Yeah, who, all the details are there. He yeah, might have done it himself. Uh, yeah, well, he, he also, a, when the heist goes wrong, it's him. He's he starts shooting. Yeah, yeah. He does seem like the uh, most kind of unhinged character from the very start, with his just unpredictable, violent acts that he does, like right away to Bundai. Uh, and um, there's also the the. I think maybe this is what you were leading to, Perry. Too. There's that. Uh, the one quote is. The one partner to Katano goes like, "Do you think he killed her?" And he goes, "Who cares?" Because he's just fucking like he doesn't give a shit. He's just there to kill yeah. whoever he needed to kill. And that's one. That's also one of my favorite introductions to him because one of the first two things I think he says is just how apathetic he is to all the death that's around him. He doesn't give a flying mm-hmm. fuck. But he does straight up say, "Who cares if he killed her or not?" So it, it does heavily right. imply that he's killed the family already. Like the the, right. the father killed the family. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's insane because they also do the whole stylizing in the beginning where he's like, he gets home and it almost feels like you're in this empty house, but we know that he's a family man. Um, and it's designed that way. And then whenever they do show one of the, the, the family members actually alive and walking around, they do this kind of like freeze frame cutting where it stutters Mm -hmm. and, and it just feels very unnatural and they don't really interact like they would as a family member. It's just like they just go to the place that they died in. And then the first reveal, which is amazing, is when there's a door that's blocking one part of the room and the daughter comes in and it, that freeze frame kind of uh, stutter effect happens. She goes behind the door and then he closes it and she's just on the piano <laughs> rotted already it's done that transition yeah. and then i love that the yeah. piano music is playing yes. so you think that the little girl is playing the music yeah. and then he closes the door and the music is there and yeah oh, well, and also he never sees the corpses 
Because only we're only the audience sees the corpses when we're with him. We're seeing. Yeah, he's the, pretending like, everything's fine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He, he even goes he, even, even though he's looking into yeah. a shattered yeah. mirror <laughs> and trying to shave his face with a toothbrush. Yeah, he's like, no, I'm <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, and I'm a it great can't dad. be overstated. <laughs> this segment is like it's like six minutes long. Yeah, it's, it's a it's... huge part of the movie. It's just a detour into grotesque horror. Yeah. Um, the the tonal shift this movie takes. The only other crime movie I can think of that does something like it is like, I don't know, Dragged Across Concrete or something. Sure, yeah. Where you just have this <laughs> this sudden episode of really mean-spirited brutality that kind of, it makes the whole rest of the movie feel haunted yeah, well, and then and then I mean it. The, that scene, you know, it goes on for as long as it does. It's so difficult to watch. It's so painful to watch how ghastly it is. And then, even a, a, as if it were, like wasn't enough of like almost like a sick joke, Ishii ends that with Kitano uh, basically preparing to have sex in front of the daughter's corpse with his hitman partner. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which I was just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, again, like what, what, what else can you throw, throw into these guys? And, and I mean, the, the, even the ex cop sequence is also done oh. in a way with the vocabulary of, um, of, of horror where he's in like this hotel sort of like restaurant, um, dinner with his family is kind of oh, like underway. Yeah. There's this kind of yeah. pleasant sort of like ambiance and, and the kind of the hum of the staff are, are all around. And the, the, the camera does this really, really long push in on him at the table while his wife and kid go to check out or whatever it is that they're doing. And at a certain point it gets close to him and all of the sound design disappears. And then it pulls yeah. out and like the staff are gone. Like they were never there. And the, the hum is in, is all gone and something is just like completely wrong. And he tries to run uh, his, his wife and kid out to the car to be like, I don't know what's wrong, but something, a vibe has shifted. And that fucking horrible image of him walking to the car and the daughter in his arms waving back towards the camera and you don't know what the fuck she's waving at but you're like that doesn't seem right and then she turns around and she's fucking waving at the hitmen who are waving her there's something just so horrifying yeah. about yeah. you know the, the how the, the 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 patience of that and the fact that the hitmen are like abusing you know this friendly gesture with the little girl right before they're about to unload their fucking guns into that car which yeah. obviously his instinct as a as an ex-cop action star moment is to use the car as cover uh, in which case his family inside the car just fucking gets slaughtered, which yeah. is also a, like a crazy detail While because like the instinct other. is you go naturally a guy dives out of the way of bullets. That's just, that's how a fucking crime movie works. But you know, to also give it the consequence of, you know, well now his family inside the car has been, you know, bullet riddled is just a, a an yeah. insane detail. They f and it feels so um, like th that, that whole sequence as it's not quite as, you know, horrifically ghostly as the one we just saw, but just there's just not the pale, bloated <laughs> right. corpses but the, done with special effects. But, you know, but like. the, the, to like to sink out all of the sound and then make it as if you know it's just a ghost restaurant in a sense. It, it gives the people that are after them some a real sense of power. Like, how are they able to do this? Even this seems like a like yeah. a psycho <laughs> like how this seems supernatural. Impossible. Yeah, it seems yeah. supernatural. And then when they yeah. have the whole setup with the headlights on them, he's waving at the daughter. It just feels like they're ghosts like they're these angels of death kind of thing and and it does feel more like a horror movie rather than just um hitman going after a a, a bunch of people and their families it, it there's this extra elevated supernatural effect to it it's interesting because you have katano as yeah it's it's katano as a katano protagonist basically like he's playing the type he, he's playing mm -hmm. uh specifically compared to his character in boiling point uh, his second movie, mm -hmm. who sort of appears halfway through this baseball Yakuza movie and makes everything really dark in his presence. There's just this, like, malicious trickster demon Yakuza guy. Uh, but Dark it, rain cloud. Yeah, yeah, he, exactly. He's a, he's a dark <laughs> rain cloud. But it's, it's like you have all these regular low-level criminals, and then, again, you have, like, the, the sort of intertextual punch of oh, that's Takeshi Kitano. Like, he is a god compared to these people. Uh, yeah. He, he is the image of, like, the dangerous Yakuza man. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it's like that crossed with 
Michael Myers or something. Because <laughs> yeah. he is just popping up. Uh, he has these little chattering teeth, like little wind-up chattering teeth toy that he uses mm-hmm. as like a, a calling card where that will show up in the sound mix like right before the danger. Um, That's so cool. God. Yeah. It, I was thinking that the bit with uh, Hizu in the restaurant, it really is just that incredible slow zoom onto Hizu smoking because he wants to, he knows that they're coming after him mm-hmm. and he, his daughter has to use the restroom. So his ex-wife takes her there and then he's just smoking at the table and you hear, yeah, like you hear dishes being picked up, you hear people talking, you're all this stuff. And when the camera moves out and you see all the plates are still out, like all the food is still there, half eaten, but just mm-hmm. everyone is, has been like, raptured or something from <laughs> yeah. the scene. They're just gone. That's the thing. You don't it's, see them outside later or something waiting because they heard like yeah. a gunshot. It's just, they're just yeah. disappeared. Yeah, It's one of the most striking images I've seen in this kind of movie. Yeah. It's and, something I've thought of constantly since I first saw it. And I love too the panic that, that it portrays with the camera too because as he like grabs his family and starts running they just do this like side tracking shot while he's mm-hmm. you know going over each booth and everything like that it's it's uh it just you, you feel the panic and 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 the just how fucking terrified uh, he is so yeah i think yeah. it's it's fantastic also not and, to mention there's like just aside from all this awesome horror direction that actually makes you legitimately creeped out for them um, the action stuff is still amazing in within these sequences because when he starts <laughs> shooting, they have so many shots after he realizes his his uh, daughter and his his um, wife has been killed uh, that like they they do these like um, ex- explosive gunshots where it, it looks like he's almost like barely not hitting his face when they shoot the uh, the door beside his head and, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Like the action stuff is still fantastic as well throughout. Oh, yeah. I, I love that little camera maneuver. It does when he opens up the passenger yes. side door to look in at them. And he is so distracted by obviously the, the sort of bloody corpses of his family sitting there. And you can just see the camera just slightly drift a little bit to the right where the one hitman has actually opened up the driver's side door and has a gun pointed directly in his face, which is yeah. when he gets that instinct to like obviously jump away. And because actually Hizu is like clearly the most familiar with the consequences of this kind of violence, he actually handles himself quite calmly and skillfully compared to like how every other character ends up responding <laughs> yeah. to this um uh s- scenario and he's the one who ends up going to uh both bandai and um uh mitsua who are just and like is the one who tells them like <laughs> at one point that's yeah he's like he, he's like you guys gotta like fucking run away like this is like you know you know i was almost you know my family was killed i was almost killed you guys need to get away and they try to get away by um getting a bus out of town which is this incredible sequence that almost reminded me of like when carlito doesn't get away in carlito's way oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like the subway chase and like it's, it's not quite a full like athletic chase like that or anything like that but there's this long sequence and a really slow one take push in in a in a bathroom Mm -hmm. where you know he you know the the bondi has been has been shot and the hitmen are taking shots at him including an insane detail where it looks like kitano like shoots underneath the door yeah like like in the little crack in 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 the floor and he like awkwardly hits bandai in like his ass or like his leg yeah he caps him in the butt like twice or something to finish uh, him off er, (laughs) earlier bandai's running so rude (laughs) he gets shot in the back and something that i love uh takashi ishii for is he has those um those like little freeze frames on gun impacts so there's this mm-hmm. great big plume, this huge squib that goes off on the back of Bondi's shoulder and then a freeze frame. And yeah, it's the long take where they're having this very dramatic uh, death scene. That's also, it's like Bondi and Mitsuya, they sort of, their love is made most explicit there. You know, yeah. like they, they, they kiss at the end. Uh, I think, and yeah, and I think Bondi... Mitsuya is crying and the whole time they're just these weird extra gunshots going off through the door 
they're like dude give them this romantic moment he's using his dying breath to like finally express a love he yeah. maybe didn't feel comfortable mm. with due to the sort of social or power hierarchy and then he had this kind of like repressed thing and he was like i was going to escape with this with this man who was going to become my lover and you can hear the other one uh mitsuya being like you know where are you going like i'm coming <laughs> too like you know we're gonna go together and they're trying to kiss each other and katano's just shooting him in the ass and blood's going everywhere <laughs> all over the bathroom you're like jesus christ and th- that shot ends with it push because you talked about the folks of architecture in this movie earlier and something that i was mm-hmm. really struck by is the shot ends up focusing on this heavy metal door in the bathroom and not mitsuya's face but his reflection against the blood stain in the door mm-hmm. uh, yeah. is like the center of the frame and that's another one of those images where i don't know i first saw this movie i think three years ago and I, I think about that shot all the time. Yeah, there's there's so many great mo- like I, I think about that long dolly along the concrete pillars during that torture <sighs> sequence is a great moment of like the architecture coming up. That one mm-hmm. shot of him recruiting Hizu and like it's in like this sort of like apartment complex where there's like a woman who's over top of them, like looking down. Yes. There's so much great like, you know, little framing choices like that, that that really, you know, can you can tell someone is used to drawing panels and is used to, you know, really graphic imagery, as Perry has been saying. But all also the fact that it does uh, at this point in the film, one of my favorite things that a movie can do, which I always cite uh, as a reference point to live and die in LA where the main character dies and there's a real left in the movie. Uh, It's always a decision that when it's done, it doesn't always work, but when done right, it just completely discombobulates you. It becomes so unpredictable because you're just like your entire footing was with the existence of this nightclub character who orchestrated a heist to pay his debts. And you're like, that guy just died confessing his love for another man in, in his nightclub. And there's still like 20 minutes left in this <laughs> yeah. movie. And you're, so you're like, what the fuck is like gonna could possibly go that, down. And, 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 and briefly it turns into a sequence where Mitsuya just aimlessly wanders around Tokyo. Like this, like almost like this city graveyard environment that he's been cursed to. He's d- at first d- angrily dreaming of revenge. And, but it then decides to tie himself to an anchor on like a rusty dock and like contemplate shooting himself or like, you know, yeah, crucifying himself it. almost yeah. in terms of some of the imagery. I was <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? I think it, and it's this, go ahead. It's this shot of like his shoulders, and his head, and he has a gun to his head, and just behind him is black water, and at the very top of the frame, you can see, like, bits of moonlight reflecting, like a, a like a halo, almost, in the water. It's yeah. An unbelievable so shot. Yeah, it's it's great. Like, I think this is just a... It's and a- so I was like, what is this movie? Like, where else could they go? This guy's just in suicidal despair, crying over this lover, and I was like, I did not expect that that would be where this movie was gonna go, when these guys were like, we're a bunch of poor guys gonna plot a heist. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I think it's a testament to Takashi's uh, control over these characters, and making you really care about every single one of them by by this point, because doing that transition, now it's really focused on, do you care enough about uh, Mitsuya that you want to see see it through? Have him get on that bus and get the fuck out of there. And and you really do. I, I did, based that. on the performance alone. Yeah, yeah you know what? I was, have, I was totally sold, because the way you first see this guy, and he just, like, doesn't, like, he's just, he, he's a cutthroat hustler, and then at this point where he is, like, he has a real genuine, you know, sort of emotional experience that we are let in on. And there's so yeah. much tragedy to it and, you know, so much pain. Yeah, yeah. And to, that, like like you guys said, just, just taking the time now to spend with him going through this kind of just breakdown, not even wanting to live anymore. Everything that he's loved is is dead. And, and even if it was like newly discovered. Um, and so him and Hizu just chilling in the car while Hizu's thinking about <laughs> shooting up heroin, listening to that, like oh, yeah. r- that, that serenading music where they're talking about chasing after yesterday's and, faded dream and yeah. smiling and, after the suffering. It's like this r- big romantic ballad almost. And they take the time to make, give you the detail of him contemplating taking the heroin. And he's just like, you know what? And he throws it away. And it's just this, it's a small moment, but it's just something where, you know, they're like, he's, He's just kind of past it, I guess, in a sense. It's like this is this is all just 
I don't know. It's like too much. Well, well, he, well, he, they they both choose the option of why self destruction when yeah. we can fucking kill these fuckers. You yeah, know? yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. What really, what really brings men together? Let's go. <laughs> yeah, two guys in a car in a rainy stakeout waiting for the yakuza to pull up so that they can just fucking massacre them in like a garage shootout. Just so much That's rain right. and like gun smoke, and they wait for the car, the 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 car to like drive in and everything too. The slow motion as Mitsuya like you know run and that like weird like zoom freeze frame thing it does as he like runs across from the other end of the frame and everything too. It's 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 awesome. There's also crazy fucking chunky squib work as oh, yeah. these oh, characters are like executing each other in the rain and stuff and katano rolls up not just with an umbrella which i am stoked to learn that that was he was kind of forced to do it because he makes it look pimp anyway i didn't question it, it for a second i was just like so natural yeah, do you know what? It's, it's like the guy doesn't he just doesn't care about killing and doing this kind of work so he, much that he he's didn't just like, want to he, get yeah he's like in his, his track almost. suit wet yeah exactly. that was it yeah, exactly. that, he's in like know? an all white track suit just like why are you yeah. fucking disturbing me gunshots 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 he just wants to go back to the game or whatever the hell he's doing <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's it, it's so sick. And the way that they're executing the Yakuza and then they're shooting, obviously, like his hitman partner, which he's really um, up, upset about as as well. And then you just get Kitano just unloading into a cop car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that, that sequence I, too. I, I don't know. Maybe you mentioned it already. This this beat, but when uh, like the car, like the garage door is open, and then the one partner that comes in to to help them to help him again, uh, just crashes like as as fast as he can into their car and gets out and starts shooting. It's like, awesome. It's, fucking, yeah. it's so yeah. badass. <laughs> and there's there's one bit where a guy is like desperately trying to save his life, and he's holding a bulletproof vest in front of him like a shield. Right. He's oh, trying to angle it sick. to block a handgun. It's the 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 desperation and just kind of the, holding it like a shield in Troy or something. Yeah. It's sick. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. The, the fighting gets so messy in this movie. Um, it's it's just so nasty. I mean, I feel like we have spent the past hour kind of being like, "Oh, this movie's so nasty," but it really when you watch a lot of movies like this. It's rare that you can find something that is both incredibly uh, gross and, you know, it's something that feels dangerous, but something that also is just so uh, technically controlled. Yeah. You know, something that's so mm-hmm. stylized and so confident like this. Yeah, it strangely yeah, doesn't. I mean, feel like chaotic. I mean, like I like I like I think about that crossfade shot that it ends on, which I think is amazing. Which is just Kitano shooting a cop car in the background in like a full on like you know like thunder and lightning storm, and you just get um, Mitsuya just like running away from him in the other direction being like well we killed almost all the yakuza and we killed uh, takeshi kitaro's like partner he's like i guess that's good enough i'm just <laughs> going to escape but it but it crossfades into the shot of him driving away in the tunnel because he's going to be escaping on the bus he's like i'm going to you know cut my losses i did my damage i made him feel the kind of pain that i felt i think that's kind of what he was aiming for was that like you know you took something from me i took something from you and uh yeah but that that like huge you know sort of silhouette of just mitsuya running away in a rain soaked storm going straight into the crossfade of the of the bus tunnel imagery is just like it's so technically precise and mm-hmm. so expressive to what this character is going through which is not exactly what you would expect of the movie kind of pulling the exploitative and cruel choices it's sometimes making in other moments, you know? Yeah. yeah. And the way the movie ends, I mean, every time I see it, I, 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 I get a little choked up. Oh yeah. I, I find it very affecting. Um, because after that, you know, there's one last bit where Mitsuya, he's on the bus, then he's out of Shinjuku. It's like the first time you see like a wild green hill in the whole movie. Uh, and he goes on this. It's uh, fucking sunny. Yeah, it, it, it's sunny. <laughs> the weather's gorgeous. He's listening to the music on his Walkman, uh, and he gets off this bus rest stop. He gets two cans of tea. He brings it back. He puts the tea next to um, Bondi's ashes. Uh, yeah, beautiful. And then he puts on his music and he looks up, and <laughs> Takeshi Kitano's there, and Takeshi Kitano's boss is dead. And you sort of get the reading I always got of it is like Kitano is in the same boat 
as uh, Mitsuya here, where it's like their lovers are both dead. Yeah. And it's yeah. just Katano's now here for revenge. And it's this very sad, you know, noir fatalism kind of ending where they both shoot each other. And then Katano sits down uh, in the aisle across from uh, Mitsuya. And they both just sort of bleed out on the bus as the bus moves on, like it's the end of collateral or something. And, yeah, and, and other I, passengers get on. I was yeah. gonna say literally Vincent collateral on the dang subway, you know. Uh, and they <laughs> yeah, and the bus driver does like the count but doesn't notice that they're dead. He just assumes that one yeah. is looking out the window and one is sleeping. And it's just like I, I love too that Katano's body, um, after he gets realizes that he's gotten shot and it looks like it's in the heart, I believe. Uh <laughs> he kind of has more of that. Like I'm, tr- he's truly dead. He's kind of more hunched over and unnatural looking. Whereas I love what they give Mitsuya, which is this like he's he's kind of just looking out the window. And although he is dead, we know that he he it has this this sense of like it's kind of over, and he's now reminiscing while looking yeah. th- through like looking at the sun as the bus drives on, and he's beside his his lover, even though, like the ashes of his lover, and it it, it just feels. Uh, a little bit more like a humane ending for him than it, it is Katana, even though they have the same death. It feels different. Yeah, it, It's not like you don't get the feeling that, oh, he's going to hell or something like that. Yes, you know, it's, it's a very exactly. beautiful last image of him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, yeah, I agree. I, th- I thought that th- I loved this ending. I thought it was um, amazing. Obviously very sad. And I do like the... How, how long it takes because he's in the very back of the bus so and he notices Katano as soon as he pretty much walks onto the bus and he take they take so much time together actually just staring at each other and walking mm-hmm. and getting closer or at least Katano's getting closer but you'd think that he would you know just take out the gun and start shooting but there's this like shocked quality that he just kind of s- sits in before finally going all right, draw, and then they like do it at the same time. But it, I just I loved that that um, that space they gave them. I guess. Yeah, and to go back to the whole Katano as sort of an image of himself in this movie, that bit at the end is when he looks the most to catch Katano. Like he has the the mm-hmm. oval sunglasses. He's got the suit, and Even it's like the, it's like <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He walked off the set of Sonatine. He is like, I'm, <laughs> I'm here. My ghost is my vengeful ghost has come back to take the life of everyone who thinks they can escape this lifestyle <laughs> or these choices. I'm back, baby. That's right. Um, but but yeah, and 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 that's going. So we're pivoting towards the reductive rating round. This was a very solid, to maybe even a high four for me. I'm going to come back to this one because I I. I kind of knew what I was getting into when Perry picked it and when I saw who directed it based on what he had previously written, but it was still a pretty deceptive movie for me and rewardingly so, I thought, in in being a sort of a Yakuza crime movie and, you know, sort of graphically stylized um just vice grip horror, just punishing second half that, that that it has. But I I thought that you know for a in if in speaking in sort of just like traditional neo noir terms, I thought the 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 character archetypes were actually pretty fleshed out. I liked the financially desperate situation that he decides to put them in that obviously is immediately sort of like you know understandable and kind of relatable and these characters who are frustrated by the social and power hierarchy of 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 the yakuza i i loved the detail that they all live on like these you know these wet dirty streets and the yakuza are hanging out in the offices making all the money they're like yeah we're gonna fucking rob those guys it's hilarious how bad their fucking heist is um even though it's shot incredibly well and it's incredibly fun to watch and when the crime goes horribly wrong like we We've seen so many crime goes wrong films. Yeah. I don't think that there's anyone who's been more miserably punished in such a <laughs> doom laden fashion for it uh, to as I don't even think the Coen brothers would hurt characters as much as these people. And to uh, the point where get, they have to get, literally change the genre for the film momentarily. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Takeshi Kitano showing up as the vengeful, you know, uh, dark cloud ghost of death. Who's just a vicious gay serial killing hitman. It's just wonderful uh, casting. I'm, I'm stoked to see that he was, you know, okay after his accident and got right back into the groove. Oh yeah, and uh, 
and yeah, I, I just got to praise Ishii and and his, especially his his visual direction. Like, I it was the right call to bring in uh, Kitano's cinematographer from Violent Cop mm-hmm. to get all of those architectural, um, unusual um, angles and sort of lenses that they use to get these dynamic zooms and movements and everything that you get the amazing colors and and rain and sort of cityscape photography that he's doing, and also just pure nastiness of headshots of fucking family corpses of some dynamic action like all of it's kind of strung together into a second half that is just so bleak and operatic and very tragic but also with just a, the right level of an unnerving dose of cruelty to it that is what other people wouldn't do other people would do the the tragedy of this scenario and and uh, my the thing that impressed me is that he doesn't sacrifice one for the other. Because yeah. I think someone else would get so swept up in being like the, I'm the guy who fucking drew angel guts. Mm-hmm. I'm going to show you the grossest shit you've ever seen and <laughs> would maybe lose track of the characters. But the fact that this also pulls off one of the characters dying and expressing his, you know, his his repressed queer love for another character and also while getting shot in the ass pathetically and you know (laughs) one thing doesn't it doesn't feel unbalanced in that way it feels like it's yeah just you know it's really nailing both of the things that it wants to be the 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 cruel violent punishing horror film and also the just tragic crime film about a bunch of desperate underdogs who thought they could uh, subvert the system and Realize they couldn't. So yeah, very strong four for me. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm right there, right there with you. I I, I agree. I don't feel I, just given what we've talked about in the last hour, you'd feel like this would be it, it, the style and all of these transitions would have kind of a whiplash effect or feel chaotic. But it is like it is seamlessly edited together and paced, and I, I and all the different stylizations that he throws in there and different. Uh, uh, Camera techniques and everything, it, it, it all feels like it comes together in one very, very complete vision, um, which I just, again, given what we've talked about, feels like it wouldn't, but it's amazing. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's a uh, Takashi Ishii has a uh, has a unbelievable sense of control, I think, in, in what he's interested in. It's it's amazing. And I mean, the performance is all around every single character I found intriguing and unique uh, and 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 they each all kind of have their like eccentric qualities. All the action stuff with the squib work, once it gets to that as well, mixed in with the horror elements, are are f- flawless, just fantastic. Um, and I really do love this uh, this poster where every single person is just like screaming at you. Um, yeah. <laughs> and except for Katano, who's in the like top left, and he's yeah. just kind of like, "What's up? I'm Katano." <laughs> so I, I just I think that's great. Um, so yeah, I, I love. Strong four. His placement in that... Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm good. Strong four. I was just going to say, I love his placement in that poster because it kind of implies like he's on the team. Like, <laughs> yeah. The, 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 yeah, he's the part five of the five. On, yeah, he's, it seems like he's <laughs> one of the Gonin, but because Jimmy's on the bottom of the poster right? Uh, instead. But they're you know, like, hey, here's our star. Here's Takeshi Kitano. People will know him. You know, all right, we're going to put him in the top left. <laughs> that is awesome. Hell yeah. But for uh, for you, Perry. Um, yeah, I'm right there with you. I think this movie is a really strong four. I think it's just a incredibly sturdy, uh, ambitious genre movie. Like, I, I don't find it like transcendent per se, but as far mm. as just really muscular, ambitious crime filmmaking goes, it's almost as good as it gets. Like I, I, I get such a, a thrill out of watching this movie every time. Uh, I watch the director's cut, which is like two hours, and it never I was actually going to ask length. you about that because I because we we obviously we all hunted down the director's yeah. cut because I asked Perry and I was like that's the mm-hmm. one that's the one to watch. I'm mm-hmm. assuming they made him cut the six minutes of a uh, of family corpses or you yeah, know did the, what, I, what, or I, what did they I, make I, him cut for the theatrical? I haven't seen the theatrical cut. But I know it's ten minutes shorter, and I'm going to assume it's yeah some of the six of those more ten minutes are <laughs> yeah <laughs> grotesque sequences are uh, shortened. 
Yeah, the the entire sequence that feels like you're watching like a fucking NC-17 fucking murder movie all of a sudden. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> yeah. what got the cutting oh, room floor, um, if, if anything. Something did, uh, the, a one shot I don't think we mentioned did just pop in my head. I love that one. I think it's when Bundai, it's, it's after they do the heist. And Bundai's kind of like nervously looking over the balcony of his club and he can see the entrance. And they Oh do yeah, this, when like, all the guys come up behind him. Yeah, and they do this awesome like crane shot over the entire staircase and you see the the Yakuza on the Mitsuya bottom. Mitsuya coming up the from the bottom yeah. to like shoot at them and stuff like wow. that too. Yeah, it's a six scene. That's it. That that I thought was incredible. But again, yeah, his style, just unbelievable control. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also a split diopter of him uh, chugging the beer while a bunch of people are fighting in the batting cages. That's a cool shot, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I want to mention I have not seen it yet because I have not seen nearly as many Takashi Ishimuru as I should. Like, I love all the ones I've seen, but I know that Gonin 2 is. It's like Gonin 2, the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> right? Five, yeah. yeah it's five women teaming up. And, uh, and it also has Ken Ogata, who's, you know, the lead of Mishima Life 4 Chapters, oh, as Mr. I think Mishima the villain. Himself. So, I don't know. Uh, maybe worth checking out. Definitely. That if, sounds awesome. Same if, cinematographer, too. I'm yeah. sold. I'm going to go check it out. If Gonin sounds good to you, the listener, uh, or if you've seen it and liked it, I would also very strongly recommend Takashi Ishii's A Night in Nude, which I've mentioned a couple other times, which is this similarly... Um, genre agnostic thriller uh, about a man who will do anything if you pay him. And it's just... I, I think Gonin's more fun, but A Night in Nude is... Uh, every bit is accomplished. Hell yeah. I'll check it out. Uh, well, that's going to wrap it up, I think, for Gonin here. We're going to be right back, and we're going to be talking about the mission. Stick around. All right, we are back and we are talking The Mission, the 1999 Hong Kong triad crime film directed by Johnny Toe, written by his regular screenwriting collaborator Yao Nai Hao, and starring, uh, among many others, hard-boiled and infernal affairs Anthony Wong alongside a bunch of other regular Toe collaborators, uh, Roy Chung, Lam Suet, uh, Simon Yam, I fucking love Simon Yam, Eddie Ko, uh, Francis... I actually don't know how to say that last name. Um, but these are these are a lot of Johnny Toes. Guys, this is our first time talking about Johnny Toe on the show, I believe. Jamie, is that right? Is I that think right? it is, Can yeah. That possibly? Oh my I think God. it might be. Yeah, because we... Kind of crazy. We watched a couple together. Like I think we watched Throwdown together and stuff, but we haven't watched anything for the show, so yeah. Damn, yeah. I've seen 17 of his movies, never talked about him before. So it's going to be our first time talking about Johnny Toe. He is one of my favorite modern Hong Kong um, filmmakers. He's an incredibly prolific and consistent genre guy for his production company, Milky Way Image, where he works with a lot of the same writers and technicians and cinematographers and actors. And um, even even today are putting out some pretty high quality stuff for pretty reasonable, almost independent um, budgets, including for his protege, Soi Chung, who I think we've talked about on the show, because I think his 2022 very nasty black and white serial killer procedural limbo, I think, made our oh, best yeah. genre movies of, of the year list. So I love Mil that. Milky Way Image still around still doing stuff but toe's career goes all the way back to the 1980s where he got started in feature film around the time that you know john woo and Choi hark were you know uh really um breaking onto the scene and had their kind of takeover of of the industry especially with the heroic bloodshed films that they were doing and so johnny toe got started doing some films with like chow yun fat including uh, a race car driver melodrama uh, called all about a long um which is actually pretty good um and a, a a little bit of a generic sort of cops and crooks like crime procedural in the vein of like a better tomorrow or something mm -hmm. but with some insanely gory violence in a movie called the big heat um, so in the late eighties, that was what he kind of got, got started on. You know, he was very much exploiting the trends that were popular based on those other, um, producers and filmmakers. And, uh, but by the nineties, Toe would work in just about 
any genre. Wuxia, heroic bloodshed, romantic comedies, musicals, uh, pretty sick uh, firefighter drama actually called Lifeline that I like a lot. The one Jamie mentioned, the judo champion drama Throwdown, which has got to be to this day the most romantic life uh, yeah. affirming and musical movie ever made about the art of grabbing another man by the arm and fucking flipping him and dislocating him, yeah. you know, and throwing him through tables and shit. It's, it's a surprisingly beautiful, empathetic movie, despite that being, um, the subject matter. Also, I think, uh, at some point we're going to have to fucking talk about heroic trio. Cause that came out on 4k from criterion recently. And that's like him doing, martial arts supernatural horror like superhero movie shit it's insane yeah i would love um, that and it's got uh, so michelle guy, Yeoh, so and maggie chung yeah let's go and maggie chung um and uh, anita mui as well so like it's just this guy's had an insane career and and, and too long and varied to get into the in, in, in entirety um of but especially after he took over milky ways directing um output which i want to say he started doing in like the late 90s like around the time of 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 the mission here and when he really found the most success he ever had because he was doing like two movies a year and at least every other one or every third one was probably like a crime or a gangster genre <laughs> yeah. film things like running out of time election ptu drug war there's a lot of incredible films um thrown in the mix here part of it is based on uh the sort of you know you could actually shoot these movies for a reasonable amount of money which is very helpful um to him but i'd say if these movies are connected by any sort of like overarching or prevailing interest it's very much in a sort of stylistic minimalism and a a, a, a strange kind of empathy for his characters mm -hmm. but a general ambivalence about the kind of barbaric sort of triad underworld that they um are all a part of his vision of cops and crooks or sort of triad gangster dramas was always a very structural one with the representatives of power and institutions making these very cold-blooded sort of greedy decisions under the guise of like some sort of traditional rituals or sort of codes. Mm -hmm. And then just the violent chaos that kind of trickles downward to those who actually do the labor of that work or orchestrate it or kind of suffer for it kind of, um, at the bottom. Yeah. Cause that, and, like with, uh, um, with, um, like a, the election uh, series, it, it, it's much more focused on, the bosses and kind of the higher ups whereas this one i feel is i mean it obviously is it's just more he was like can gangsters do democracy is what <laughs> yeah. the movie election is about and <laughs> yeah. and the answer is that you know it, it it's not really you know <laughs> yeah. it's not really a democratic power struggle like you know like they have all these codes and rituals but it's all dress up you know ultimately yeah. the and election then, movies are like you know as much as we want to look like you know we are ancient warriors of some kind or we have a, a code of conduct eventually some dude's gonna bash another dude's head in with a rock <laughs> you know that's that's yeah. the uh, that's the it's essential thing that's happening here and and i love too that he, again he's 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 so fo similarly to what we were talking about with ishii but i think toe to like a really extreme degree very very wordless precise sort of tableau framing i love the staging and the movement and the use of space and the use of sort of harsh concrete architecture of the city and it's just he he has such a great visual focus on that but it, there's also a quality to where it's just it's stripped down and part of that was the sort of limited budgets and the shooting schedules that he worked with we'll talk about it with specifically with the mission uh, some people report that it was 18 days he shot this in some people report that it was 12 days he <laughs> shot this in so no matter which way you're looking at it he shot it in a insanely low amount of days two to three um, weeks that's fucking insane yeah and, and but but the way that he's able to turn his budget limitations into actual creative choices and what they say about the characters and the world and the environment around them there's a there's just such an austere kind of professional quality about his, you know, depiction of what these guys do for their job, what their occupation is, and then mixed in with what people actually kind of went to this genre for, especially at the time, which was, it was the brotherhood. 
It was the mm-hmm. romantic camaraderie, the relationships about how these guys all relate to each other at this sort of low rung position in the underworld that they're that they're all in. And, you know, and and who maybe maybe they can find a way, unlike in the, the Ishii universe where it's like, yeah, you're punished for having those friendships and trying to help each other and trying to love each other. In this case, maybe they can find a way to bend the rules and, uh, you yeah. know, kind of kind of get away with it. But that's what I love so much about the mission specifically, because this is straight up. In every sense of the it's a fucking hangout movie. This is yes. a body, a triad bodyguard hangout movie. Yeah. I, the first time right. I watched this, I was like, this is a 90 minute movie. And at least like 75% of the runtime is like bodyguards, like just putting in the hours at work. They're sitting in a car. They're in an office lobby. They're at a convenience store. They're at a, fi- they're in a hallway. They're riding an escalator, making coffee. Who laid you out know, all of this. Sh- that's 75% of this movie. And it's awesome. Yeah. It's so sick. It, it really is like there are there are not many. Uh, well, I guess I'm going to quantify this. There are not many uh, genre movies where you can easily have a conversation without saying the name Howard Hawks uh, that have great <laughs> bits of people like hanging out together. And I guess I, this isn't one of them either. Um, but you really get that, you know, the, the, that Rio Bravo feeling in scenes of this movie oh, where yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to skip around too much, but there's a there's one shot in this mm-hmm. that's all five guys hanging out by the pool, and they're all lighting each other's cigarettes and drinking beer and talking. And you can watch that scene again and again and again and just focus on a different actor in it mm-hmm. and just see what how they're smoking their cigarette, how they're drinking their beer, when they decide to join the conversation, how, who, if they light another person's cigarette, you know. Who gives who the gag one that turns out? Yeah, to be who a puts the firecracker yeah. into yeah. the cigarette? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like you, you really can just spend time in these frames, uh, hanging out with the guys. It's great. Yeah, and they um, like another one of my favorites is is just a like a one minute shot. They're just chilling in an office and one guy rolls up a ball and they just start kicking it around and they're just kind of like that. And that's literally it. There's no words said. They just, they're just a couple buddies that are kind of bored on the job and they're like, let's just kick this fucking paper ball around. My favorite detail of that whole thing is Anthony Wong watching it from like briefly from like the sidelines and he's doing this very hard stare. And like the, the traditional scene you imagine is that, you know, the one guy has to step up and say, Hey, stop fucking right. Messing around. Around. But they you don't. know, you fucking idiots, we're on the job. <laughs> but instead, he kicks it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it just continues. Like it, it's, I, I loved it. I could have honestly watched them do that for five more minutes somehow, <laughs> just because by that point too, they've established such a good camaraderie with each other and a brotherhood. And and like you said, Perry, there's so many scenes where they're just hanging out, having these conversations, and in, in kind of like one shots. Um, with all of them in it so that there's 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 so much to take in you really yeah you really could watch them like uh, five different times for each character it's it's it yeah. really it's incredible like, it's, it's the like way which guy's answering the cell phone which guy's eating peanuts you know everyone's <laughs> yeah. doing something on an on on camera and they each give mm-hmm. a sense of personality to you know this is what makes them the personality in the frame they're the personality they're what make the frame interesting they're what make you want to spend time in it they're finding you know they're doing a kind of mundane job and they're trying their best to kind of find the little pleasures in it or to you know at least enjoy the remaining time if if all of their time is going to be spent sitting in an office they're going to fucking kick a little paper around man they're going to find something in there that's going to be that's going to be fun that's what's so cool about this uh this movie because it has a very uh i guess you could like it like a pulpy premise to it like like right off start like you you kind of think it's going to be a different movie for for um you know if it weren't for some of these um choices that toe makes um formally where you, like when we're first jumped into it which i i do want to say and i might have to ask jamie to actually plug this one in here while i'm talking about it <laughs> the opening score and the oh my motif God. that goes through the entire movie it's one of the best things I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. It's like a cheap 8-bit like arcade game, like synth restaurant dance music or something. <laughs> it has such a light, amazing vibe, um, which after the very oppressive atmosphere of Conan, of Conan <laughs> was very, uh, I, I, it was fantastic. I was so stoked to be kind of like and dropped it, into this. And it, it almost feels a little at odds with the tone of their environment. But once you realize that the characters are 
you know, kind of treating this once again like a kind of like routine thing, like yeah. you know that some guy getting shot in the middle of a scene or having some guy needing to have his throat cut is the same to them as like shooting the shit in like a break room, yeah, you know. And so the like the music kind of is thing. what kind of gets you into that vibe off the start. Yeah, and then I think what it does is it just tonally once you hear that music, it, it it's it almost makes you feel kind of safe in a way, especially compared to to Gonan. Um, just because if this is the main theme, then this is kind of the representation of the mood in a way. And and um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is this is also the same theme that I won't say why, but it, that it ends on as well. Correct as it fades to black. If I can't not, remember it's if it's the, the exact same motif. Yeah, I was gonna say it, it definitely recurs like many times throughout okay. the movie. I just it, can't remember. There are also, other ones, so it's also got at the end this this kind of upbeat thing that ends it. And I I wasn't sure if it was this, the exact same one, but regardless, that's just kind of the vibe that you get throughout the film a lot of the time. There there are its you know it has its tragic moments and its scary moments for these characters, of course, but tonally a lot of the time it does feel just very fun and entertaining and. Uh, and lighthearted in this strange way, even though you still see people getting shot left and right here and there. But well, I mean, it just has it has a little bit more warmth to it yeah, because, as as Toe was saying, to say, when when, yeah. when he conceived this movie, it needed to be shot cheaply. It needed to be shot in a short amount of time, and it was largely improvised. There wasn't much of a script when he actually made mm. it, and so you know, and and this was, I think, one of the times too where he said for the Milky Way image specifically, it was one of the times where he had a, kind of a heavier hand in kind of dealing with the story because it was so improvised. And they, you know, so he was making some artier shooting decisions and experimentations that he wanted to do, which we'll talk about when we get to the how we shoot shootouts, which is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Um, but the whole like sort of like gangster labor sort of like friendship angle of just like working professionals was like actually kind of personal to him. Uh, part of it was because he's mentioned many times and even cited it in some of the movies and in, in the credits that Kurosawa is his favorite filmmaker of all time. So you can see a little bit of the group dynamics of personalities of like a seven samurai is something that he's chased it throughout his career as much as the Howard Hawks um, element. It just the, you know, it's what he's, he's always kind of been chasing that in some quality, but also he's like, this is kind of how he feels about his Milky Way crew. He's like, it's just guys hanging out on the job, you know? Yeah. So they're, they're, uh, th th that warmth of that feeling that he clearly has just makes its way into what is otherwise the bleakness of the kind of gangster melodrama, which this does have a, you know, basic premise of when we're introduced to our sort of Hong Kong underworld environment via this triad capo named, um, Roy uh, rocking the floral Hawaiian shirt and the jean chain and the ear, very 90s. Um, and uh, he meets with a police captain to arrange some corruption. He goes outside for a smoke, just something you've seen in, in, in a gangster movie before. But cut to black, sounds of guns, bodies all over the restaurant floor that he was just in sitting still on this tableau framing because Johnny Toe presumably couldn't afford to shoot an actual massacre sequence. <laughs> and then just dudes hiding behind the walls and sweating in anticipation of having to shoot one another. And yeah. we're, is, is, is how we are dropped into what is ultimately an assassinate assassination attempt being made on the triad boss named lung. Mm -hmm. Um, and who uh, briefly hides away in the back and actually watches a guard basically just like sweat and like piss himself out of out, out of fear. And you'll, you'll be wondering when you first watch it, probably like, why is this the focus? Like, this is not really like a cool action sequence. And shortly after it will reveal that, like, the movie is about these guys, the guys who do the labor for the triad bosses who have to be like respond to a scenario like that and like wouldn't do it in like a really cool heroic bloodshed kind of fashion and some of our characters are more cool than that guy is when we actually get involved but that's mm -hmm. because um lung's brother frank played by simon yam who's in a ton of johnny toe movies election ptu you know like and a bunch of other iconic hong kong movies like i think we talked about him in bullet in the head by john Woo. Yeah. jamie i think you've mentioned him a couple times in ringo lamb's full contact i think was the one that you uh, yeah. saw oh, yep yeah he's really so good. good in full contact yeah very very good yeah i'm a big fan yeah. of simon yam 
I also yeah, he's I, he's he, he, he's awesome, and but he's the one who has to torture that guard right for for information because they were just like you know you survived that fight against uh, our our boss, so clearly like you know you were kind of in, involved in it mm-hmm. in some capacity. But it again that whole sequence it's a torture sequence for information relevant to the plot, and it's framed with like the focus on all the goons like standing around outside the truck like waiting for orders, just being like, <laughs> yeah. do we do we do we open up the back? Do we? <laughs> do we electrocute them like you know, yeah you know, are we are we doing so you know all the, and even and this movie is about the guys who wait outside the cars for the bosses it's not about like the, the actual thrilling gangster melodrama is kind of on the periphery of the movie it's really cool you know yeah. dynamic and and even those scenes where you get somebody you know in the back of a truck being tortured getting a, like a necktie around with a garbage bag all of that stuff it's it's not really you know you get the essentials from that that inter- interrogation but then really what he likes to focus on is after you know put put up the truck back uh, door and get into the conversation of their just them doing their job and then they're like all right what are our next steps and blah 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 like there's just again there's kind of an apathy to all the violence that's going on um, and they're just mm. hyper focused on either what they have to do for their job because that's just what they do or their their friendship involved within the job um, but I, I, yeah, having all of that be the focus is, is genius. And I do think it's funny that this movie, the first shot of it is DDR and I think it's James doing it. Hell if yeah. I'm not mistaken. The, the like bigger dude, uh, that's, that's walking around in the club. Scene. Yeah. If you ever wanted to play La- uh, lamb, suet playing DDR, this is the movie that you are, <laughs> you have been looking for. And actually we were, we were talking about this guy in, in the discord, um, the other day because he has the best character names of all time. Every character he plays in a Johnny Toe movie is uh, Fatty, Fatso, <laughs> uh, Big Head, you know, Boss. <laughs> you know, these are just... <laughs> That's so funny. And this one, at least you got James. <laughs> oh, dude, in, in Exiled, he's literally just called Fat. They didn't even give him Fatty. <laughs> He's not even that. He's not like a particularly huge. He's just, I mean, I guess by the standards of all the other, you know, more cut looking young yeah. gangster guys in this, I guess so. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. But he's he actually yeah, he's, ends he, up being kind of a I like his character because he, he plays him very laid back. Um, but, you know, you can tell that there that he cares about his his friends. But I, I feel like he's like the least emotive out of everybody. Um, he, he's very cool the way that he kind of presents himself a lot of the time yeah i mean some of these guys try to pull that off i think i think uh roy is is not cool at all for the most part yeah i mean he's cool in the sense that he's like he's the nightclub owner but he's just like you know his expressions are kind of on his face whereas you know some of the other people they try to recruit for the team like this character frank uh or no sorry frank is the brother uh who's trying to recruit curtis uh who's played by anthony wong who is uh tries to have a little bit more of the uh you know, the sort of like masked persona, even though he's not even like a gangster anymore. He's like a, he's like, he's a hairdresser. Yeah. <laughs> he's just a and it's like, sick baseball hat and sunglasses combo though. He li- <laughs> he works in this weird, like angular glass barber shop. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's a very striking exterior. Yeah. But, 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 but I, presumably he's kind of lost some of his kind of hardened criminal <laughs> instincts. And he actually, there's a couple times where he kind of messes up the job and they kind of have to push him and be like, dude, you got to get better at this because, you know, like Roy, who we meet from, from the opening and some of the other guys who are involved in this are, you know, guys who are making their way up the sort of triad ranks. You know, um, Roy is uh, his second in command is a guy named Shin, for example, played by Jackie Louis Chung Yin, uh, who is the kind of a young kid who's trying to make his 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 way up. Um, and then uh, Mike, played by Roy Chung, who's the inspector in Ringo Lamb City on Fire, is here as a sort of like blonde haired sharpshooter and pimp. Um, uh, I mean, we mentioned James, who is the you know the 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 weapon. He, he, it's so funny. He's the DDR guy and he's the weapons expert. Cause there's that sick multi frame like split screen of him like cleaning oh the guns God. and like getting them all ready. What a sick shot! <laughs> it, it's there's nothing else like it in the movie. It's just one. I mean, I one think shot. That's the most like flamboyant image in the movie. Uh, and I'll take it. It's sick. 
But it, it's very yeah. it's very strange compared to everything else. That yeah, because that because everything else is economical. Everything else is like clearly like I'm shooting this cheaply, and he's like how you know most of the time it's like how can I make do one shot instead of four would normally right. be the decision making pattern, and then he's just like all of a sudden a multi paneled thing to show that this guy knows his guns, you know. <laughs> Yeah, which I, I want to say the tactility of guns in this movie is nuts. Mm-hmm. There is so much just about like people are cleaning their guns, people are like kind of playing with them a bit. They're just playing with the slides. Uh, people are twirling guns on their fingers. All the shootouts, uh, which we'll talk about later, I suppose they're broken into shots of the guns are sort of segmented into like. Here's a shot of the breach. Here's a shot of the the um, the barrel. Like, there's so much just about like the weight and the function mm-hmm. of the guns that you don't really see in a lot of action movies. The guns kind of feel like an ethereal thing that creates a, a bang or something. But in this, you know, you really sit with them. Yeah. Yeah, it feels, it's an important important part of the job, baby. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. their, it's just like it's their essential tool. Uh, they really could not do this <laughs> this uh, work with without it. And I think, um, I mean, in true Hong Kong cinema fashion, too, like when they shoot these things, they feel so weighted and loud and mm-hmm. just um, just massive. Oh my god, the sniper rifle fire that goes off in this oh my movie god. is crazy. Oh yeah, like I love the lead up to like you know J- you know James eating peanuts on the table and and you know you, we were introduced <laughs> to Shin and everybody, but then once they have that first big shootout, which is I think that where that guy is on the on the rooftop and they're like kind of navigating this narrow alleyway. Yeah, well, and, 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 yeah. and we're briefly introduced to the contradiction of their existence, which is that, like, mm. they are guys that are hired to stand around in suits and wait to catch a bullet for the boss. And so, yep. so much of it is them just, like, sweaty and sort of tensely, like, riding an elevator or driving around in a car or walking him through every mundane space he the boss might want to go through. Sit at his kitchen table, read the newspaper, yeah. you know, drink his coffee. You know, the, the, these guys are perpetually perpetually in that Prepared zone where they are meant lives. to be hanging out in a break room or like watching security camera footage or riding the escalator with him at the mall or something. And at a moment's notice, you know, and it's so funny, one character, I think it's Roy at one point straight, he, he starts losing it. He goes, you know, we're born to see action, not stand here all day. Like it's like, it's, it's almost unbearable how much waiting they have yeah. to do. And Johnny Toe totally makes you wait us. for it too. <laughs> yeah. Even even though it's like an eighty fucking minute movie, there's like so much of this movie is like it is plotless. It is guys sitting around, walking the boss around, waiting for them to be attacked, and then eventually, right after he says that, you know, I can't stand here all day any longer, they trigger that first sniper rifle attack scene where it is you know positioned on kind of like a high rise or maybe over some sort of like parking structure right above them, just shooting yeah. down. And even the filmmaking really emphasizes the kind of confusion and even and even during the action scene the waiting like it is like when's he going to take his next shot when can i get around this corner you know and the imposing sort of shadows on the alley walls or the guards like aiming down sight at the sniper wondering if like they're the next one who's going to be taking a bullet even the camera will like drop to the ground like right next to like the mercedes benz they're like taking cover behind and you know so much focus and and in camera placement and editing on just like the stillness of their surroundings and the damage that could happen to anyone at any second Oh yeah, and and the like the strategies that they take, especially initially when they're trying to find out where the the gunfire is coming from, and so they're hiding in between two of their cars that they've parked, and the one guy just like throws up his jacket, which honestly it seems like a good idea, but nothing happens, so they're like, oh fuck, like they just like what now kind of thing, <laughs> and and the one guy decides he's like, all right, I'm just gonna go for it, and he kind of just moves out into the open and goes into a side wall, just full and send, yeah, and so the guy starts shooting. <laughs> But what's brilliant, too, is that the camera kind of pans over with him. So it shows that after a certain point, the guy can't see him anymore. So he's actually safe on that side of the wall. And I just like like the, the constant communication that they have together and then the camera following them in certain ways. So so you can actually get the logistics of everything that's going on, too, is is really well controlled and, and honestly brilliant. And it's, it's also exciting because it's so loud and. Um, you also have like a guy, I think he, another guy goes to the left side and goes under these like 
advertisements like a tarp yeah like a something. tarp yeah. advertisement and then and then just starts <laughs> running and they have this amazing shot where it cuts back to the sniper rifle uh point of view and you can see the guy or at least the 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 tarp kind of moving along but it looks like it yeah, could just be wind and so it's 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 just amazing how he connects all these shots together it's 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 a, a great sequence and i love how i mean uh, this might sound like a kind of obvious thing to say about the film, but like how every, every shot there really has a, a clearly communicable purpose. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the action scenes are because the, the re- most of the movie is, you know, it's a hangout movie. You can take in the frame however you want. Uh, it's, it's pretty relaxed. There are a lot of wide shots and long shots, but the action scenes are b- broken down into like, Basically, just cause and effect, cause and effect, shot after shot, and even from the start, when there's the uh, the, the massacre in the restaurant, there's the the first like real suspense scene has these guys going through the restaurant's kitchen, and it's just these really slow camera movements where the camera will not move unless they move, and it won't see mm-hmm. something unless they see it, and the yeah. whole movie kind of keeps that. Uh, that ethos where you're not going to see something unless a combatant is also seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very like artfully functional in a weird mm-hmm. way. Like, it it, like it's you. not someone just like, like you, you know, ne- you're never under the impression he's like bored behind the camera or he's just mm-hmm. like, just showing you something for the sake of logistics, but he's keeping the geography clear. And at the same time, like making very, very, deliberate and mannered choices that are suitable to the characters in their environment, to the kinds of situations these guys would find themselves in, to the kinds of sight lines that they would have, to the kind of, you know, to to the unbearable uh, amount of anticipation that you would mm-hmm. have. Because sometimes you're looking at something and it's so still and you're like, no other action sequence would focus this long on this character's point of view looking at nothing. But then it's mm-hmm. like, maybe he sees a guy you know, just yeah, come around yeah. that corner or something. And it's and just, it's, it's that, that that's where he milks his tension from, which is really skillful. And also, you know, clearly very helpful when you can't, you know, you're not, your name's not John Woo and you right. can't afford, you know, huge set destroying budgets and sparks and motorcycles on fire flying over people. And like, you know, so on, on one level it is functional. These are, he's making functional choices based on his production um, limitations, but it's just, it's one of those things too, where he's very carefully crafted the perspective of his characters to match it in, in a way that, you know, you have to be really intelligent to get, get that across. And, and it doesn't lose, uh, you know, if, if you still go into like a movie like that, wanting for, you know, wanting the brotherhood and the shootouts and it's not as hyperactive or as like filled with pageantry about it, but it, it is, it's all there and it's done in a more like, these are the guys who kind of see the more mundane, unheroic action of like being a triad bodyguard when the dude's going shopping for his wife. You know, yeah. like it's a very it's, uh, different kind of scale and it's really, really well um, done and dynamically filmed despite that. Yeah. And it also just locking you into their perspective as a group. It obviously it, it makes you more connected to their friendship um, and everything like that. But there's really not a scene where at least one of these five guys is not on camera and it makes it so that if some type of information is only given to one of them then the that person can eventually get to the group and also deliver that information which it, you know has its smaller moments in the beginning but eventually leads to something that becomes very very important to, for them so yeah um i i really like that that locked into their perspective it just it, it's exactly what you need for just the you know the ultimate hangout movie <laughs> It's a very unconventional working class hangout movie yeah. in, in, in a way. You know, it's trying to do the triad gangster movie, but it's a little bit smaller and it's a little bit lighter. And the kind and the, the kind of situations these guys deal with are like more confusing and like more kind of pathetic to kind of handle. But the dudes, they're going to fucking handle it. Even like one of my favorite details is when Simon Yams Curtis 
he, you know, at, at one point is I think it's because he gets in the car and he makes them all drive away and they abandon Roy, who was the one who was actually kind of brave enough to actually go and confront the sniper. And right. he gets really pissed off. They leaves him behind. So he like kicks his ass when he comes back. He's like, don't fucking do that. We work by a code and we watch out for each other. We protect each other. That's how this fucking shit works. And you would remember that if you weren't a fucking hairdresser, you know, you know, <laughs> like, come on, man. And <laughs> In order to get back into his good graces, he he goes and he kills a guy who's fucking with Roy's club. And this is the most like sort of Takeshi Kitano almost moment that happens in it where you just see Anthony Wong sits down right next to the guy. And the guy's like, who the fuck is Anthony was Anthony Wong in silly glasses? What the fuck? Why am I meeting with this guy? And then he, he pulls his chair a little bit closer to him. And he's, you know, he opens his legs up. He's like, I'm, you know, I'm getting right in your face, man. And then he grabs his neck and he pulls like a, a little tiny, um, you know, sort of like razor thin blade. And he just starts slicing into his neck and cuts his throat. And it's almost and, and the, the music kicks in again, this like really sort of like almost like video game motif. <laughs> and I'm only say video game just because it's like kind of has like that that cheaper synth sound. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, yep. And uh, but it but it almost sounds silly. And then the guy is like holding his neck and he's falling. He's like knocking shit. It's almost slapstick. Like this guy is like dying and knocking shit over. But again, that's where I kind of got a little bit of that violent cop quality of like, that's how a character is meant to respond to that level of violence in this world. It's not treated as like, uh, you know, like the scene from like Eastern Promises or something like that, where it's the most like harrowing neck slice yeah. you've ever seen or something. It's I've, like, no, this is a guy who's like, yeah, some pathetic loser who's, uh, you know, disrupting my friend's nightclub. He's just going to slapstick die on the side of the street or something because he did that, you know. <laughs> it's so And then I'm going to drink still. some brewskis with my boys. <laughs> yeah, because... It, it, it's just so nasty still, though, because it is it literally is, yeah. it's a single razor blade that he cuts. Yep. And there's this great shot of he puts it down on the table the guy is sitting at, the guy whose name is literally Rat. Um, <laughs> and then he leaves and he locks the doors to the, the restaurant and he pulls the shutter down. And it keeps coming back to Rat, clutching his throat. And he just won't die. Because, I mean, it's one yep. cut. It takes a while to bleed out. Yeah. And then he starts trying to leave and he starts, like, throwing himself against the shutter of the restaurant and that just yeah. cuts to Anthony Wong outside, like hanging out, like nothing's going on, and yeah, it, it's slapstick, yeah. The, the, the but it's immediately very scary. followed is is the pool. Well, yeah, but that's just yeah. it. That's just that's what I mean. Is that like for some reason the tone is like that because that's how these characters. It's routine in their world, mm, in their specific yeah. eyes, in that kind of but way. But like the actual seeing, scene is obviously like yeah. like that's how they kind of you feel like they kind of cope with it. You know, yeah. like how do you how right. do you immediately go to brewskis and smoking after doing something like that? You have to have something kind of a little bit broken in you. But that's why all of these guys relate to each other because they all exist they're like we all do this job you know we're the, we're the kinds of people who relate to each other we can relate to normal people like anthony wong was bored as fuck cutting hair you know yeah. <laughs> but he's like but with my boys you know that's a different thing Which, yeah uh, something uh we didn't mention earlier is anthony wong was briefly a hairdresser oh really oh dude he may he maybe he yeah. loved hairdressing then that's awesome <laughs> well but he, he left hairdressing to be an actor so oh, you know okay you know, no, if, he's, well, he's, he's throwing a shade then. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's going to help the boys. I, I will say the mission is like for any of those sick freaks, myself, one of them at times, who's like, oh, every movie, you know, it's a documentary of its own making. The mission is a great documentary of its own making. Yes. They're like, they're, they, it's about the making of the mission. It's about hanging out with your friends. Yeah. Not being a hairdresser anymore. Uh, how making skillful professional choices. So yeah. You, pranks. <laughs> you gotta follow the boss around everywhere. I just it's I love great. I love too that like we just were talking about the the slow death of one razor cut to the neck, and then mm -hmm. you have that pool sequence of them being casual and it ends incredibly lighthearted when the guy's just like, Could you give me another cigarette after the thing sparks up or whatever? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they all just laugh as friends. Like it it's it is uh -huh. There's there is almost a dark humor to a lot of this that I hadn't really realized watching it because um, I'm almost just convinced oh, of their yeah, friendship. There's, while there's you're some watching great it, humor. One it, of it the is. funniest, 
One of the funniest details in the movie that goes completely unaddressed is when the boss realizes that none of his criminal pals want to hang out with him anymore. And they actually make sure to leave rooms ahead of him so that they don't get shot. (laughs) And he's he's actually a little disappointed because he's having dinner with all of his pals and they're talking about the Super Bowl and shit like that. And then they just go, yeah, so we're going to leave and you need to leave like a few minutes after us, by the way, you know, and and all of your bodyguards because we don't want to get fucking snipered. Oh my god, yeah. It's it's hilarious just having that that balance and understanding to for that to still feel almost lighthearted. I think he accomplishes that. And that that is yeah. it's very cool. Yeah, it it just shows the casual routine kind of second nature way these guys have learned to deal with the job at hand. Then they yeah. and they treat it just like an occupation. Like anyone would treat a gen, you know, clocking in at the grocery store for these <laughs> guys is what they do which is taking a bullet for the big man who has money as if you are an ancient warrior of old or some kind. And that's why the camera is justified in remaining so calm, even when it's going to show you something that someone else would shoot spectacularly, like which, for example, we should get into it. The mall sequence, one of the best directed Johnny Toe sequences of all time. One of my favorite shootouts probably of of the 90s, Um, the visual use of the escalators and the levels and the pillars reflections. and the reflections. Yeah. Oh my God. It's, it's, it's stunning. It's, it's almost a painting in how, again, but how minimal it manages to be with it still. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as these hitmen just start coming out of nowhere in the mall, essentially, but it's done in this way where like the, the, the hitmen are, are trying to take out the boss and they're almost operating in like this slow moving zombie. Like I, I thought of Romero's Dawn of the Dead a little bit, not just because yeah. it was a mall, just and they're because, all you know, like disguises too. like one's a security it's, guard, one's this guy yep. like a, pulling a janitor. A janitor cart all. Yeah. <laughs> It's, all all the bodyguards are as still as fucking sculptures and the yeah. camera is like completely stationary. The blocking is so precise while they're behind the various things and the, the way that they're looking at angles and the way they spot like a guy on the other escalator going across who looks like he's doing something funny and the editing rhythm of the guy, you know, seeing that glance in his eyes and then whipping his gun out and pulling. It's just it's there's it, so it, it's so tense and it it's somehow tense and beautiful without having to do any of the big or expensive things that another action filmmaker would be forced to do to get that across. It's, it's really incredible filmmaking. Yeah. The, the and lead up to, to like, um, I just love the way that the mall looks initially before the shootout even begins. And they do that awesome, um, shot where they're both going, I think they might be going down the escalator and the security guard way across on the other side of the mall is going up, but they just start staring at each other, knowing something is off. There's a conflict about to happen. But even before that, the way that they've set up these shots within the mall, it looks like just like a maze and a labyrinth. Everything kind of looks the same. The escalators are piled on top of each other. Um, and it also kind of has a little bit of that, it's not the same because it doesn't go into like any horror aspect, but it has this weird feeling that the mall has been suddenly emptied out, uh, before this yeah. all happens. And yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's a similar thing to the supernatural thing we were talking about in the restaurant. It's just not quite as, you know, doesn't do the horror element, but it's there and it, it, it is kind of cool and, and odd. I do like it, it. it. There's that great wide shot too, of, um, all the lights in the mall going off before the shootout. Mm-hmm. Where it's like the mall is closed, so you see like the mall's like four or five stories, and you just get this wide shot seeing like lights on the fifth story go off, lights on the fourth one go off, lights on the third <laughs> go off, mm-hmm. uh, and it's just a very lonely, cold space. Um, yeah, and yeah. Everyone's posed behind pillars, and the camera's like either still or it's like very slowly panning across. I mean. I was surprised. I thought of like, I don't know, last year at Marion Bad or something, watching it this yeah. time, <laughs> where you just have all these, you know, sculpted figures standing and the camera drifting between them. And a lot of the action in this sequence even happens off screen, where someone will be shooting and you don't see like a reaction shot of what they're shooting at. Uh, there's a great shot where it's like Mike. Uh, his gun is like in the center of the frame and he's angling at something off camera and he's shooting. He's like not blinking. No one else is looking in the same direction as him. And you assume he got someone or he, uh, he got someone to go back and cover or something. 
Yeah, because he's but, just like shooting yeah. up the escalator or whatever, right? And then there's yep. other shots where you see POV shots and you get them like, you know, they think that there's a guy up there, but like they're like, is he going to make a move? Or <laughs> yeah, it's it's the minimalism really like the minimalist movement of the camera, how the movement of the actors, the fact that it's just this like white sterile space that they're all standing in. Uh, yeah, it, it really is one of the most, you know, arresting things in his filmography. Yeah. And that I do love that insane sort of quasi gag where the janitor is listening to electronic music and is like yeah. fanny pack, like, you you know, Walkman and uh, he he gets caught in in the crossfire and then is revealed to be a would be assassin as well that he had a gun but behind him the entire time, which is like one of the funnier details because he doesn't end up dying, but he gets shot. And so later the boss gives him a big fat like cash tip. They were like, thanks, dude. Really sorry for your troubles. Like, you know, we know that you're just a custodian at the mall. And uh, and the guy is so moved by that gesture of like the boss giving the worker money <laughs> that he en- actually does take an actual bullet for him out of <laughs> yeah. love when the guys come and attack them again. <laughs> and and they, such, do like, the, a, they do the shot of him just like kind of. He's not even dead yet. Uh, they don't show him actually die. He's just kind of like hunched over and like, oh, I took the bullet holding the money still like it's just it's very sad. Yeah. And and, and that does reveal the larger like uh, so much of Johnny Toe's movie, like throughout his entire filmography. There is again, there's such a, a structural interest in the economy of the underworld um Mm -hmm. specifically and that the the bosses make money the bosses give orders versus the guys who you know they they work for them and they do that and and that's just one of the more explicit examples of like here was a guy who was willing to kill a boss for money but then this guy gives him the money and all of a sudden he's gonna die for that guy you know, yeah. and like that's and, and and, you know, it does feel that there's a little bit of a source of irony because so many of these movies were borrowing their emotional qualities and their, um, you know, the 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 brotherhood elements from even heroic bloodshed. They were taken from like old, you know, sort of like martial arts movies and mm-hmm. like samurai movies. There's an ancient warrior code of honor and respect. And those movies often dealt with actually those guys getting paid fucking too, you know, like those guys, the seven samurai guys, they were working for money for a little while anyway. Um, but uh, very much you could tell that Johnny Toe's interest in this was the fact that, you know, what w- what these guys have to do for money and whether this system is actually helpful for them or whether they you know whether there is actually any sort of source of honor in it which definitely gets revealed when you know we we get kind of two sections before we get this reveal it's first right back into the playful boredom games fixing the boss's car lounging around the house kicking around some paper you know kicking around some paper for i will say that's almost like a minute or two long yeah, sequence i love it's that so sick so how much. long they just i was like just <laughs> hanging you know hanging with the, the boys, boys right from top gun yeah. you know and then so bored yeah but uh, until they managed to tail a hitman um back to the hideout of whoever is sort of orchestrating these attacks in which case there's another sort of show stopping you know uh shootout sequence Mm -hmm. that involves them hiding out in like some really tall grass with that amazing shot of like the smoke plumes coming out of the grass and everything like that and a another sniper um taking you know really really heavy shots at them from inside a dilapidated hideout um which which i will say that the hideout having like all these newspapers like strewn all over the interiors is like a really interesting choice and the the broken gla- highlights on the bro- broken glass is, is is really cool but they essentially trade shots with this sniper until they can bleed him dry so that they can question him before very coldly executing him like they do and what they find out is that it was lung's friend uh, is actually uh, behind these attacks. The owner of the opening restaurant we were hanging out in, a character we see a couple times called Fat Chung, um, who you know otherwise just kind of seemed like a fun dude to hang out with. You know, he you know, and 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 I and I when they sit him down and he just goes, "Look, I admit it. Okay, I fu- I tried to kill him. You know that. You know, I'm I'm an old man. I'm tired of serving a boss, and uh, I fucking did it. So I accept my fate." You know, yeah. and and but but it, but it's that sequence really where the expression of the you know the overall sort of structural thematic stuff really kicks in, where it is like he is saying, 
you know, at a certain point, we used to be equal young men trying to make a living. And now, like, your family is in charge, and this is like a feudal dynasty, and I'm sick of this shit. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, have, have, have to do that. And at a certain point, all the other characters kind of end up agreeing. They kind of go, you know, shit, we relate more to each other as, like, the guys on the ground than we do our boss, who we are completely... Yeah in some capacity expendable to. And when the characters become expendable, that's when it gets brutal. Like when that guy just gets his neck slit or when fat Chung just gets executed through the chest while he's eating his last meal, which I will say he takes his bullets without flinching and he oh, keeps chewing. He looks like a fucking legend. It's <laughs> so fucking legendary. He looks annoyed and exhausted and he's just like, Oh man. All right. Well, at the very least I'm going to enjoy these noodles. You fucker. <laughs> like it, it's, yeah. it's so great. And, and, so and, and the scribes are pretty big in his chest and everything too. Oh, it's he awesome. He takes a brutal shoot. <laughs> <laughs> it is wild. And then just to have that complete opposite reaction to such a brutal shooting, I thought was uh, brilliant. It, it it showed a lot of strength and it also made me laugh just because he looks so annoyed at, in, in that moment. Um, but yeah, yeah it's great. Awesome. Also, g- going back just briefly to that warehouse sequence. By the way, I wanted to mention Wong Tin Lam is that actor from Enter mm. the Dragon, baby. Yeah, Hell he yeah. looks familiar. Yeah, I wasn't sure what else I'd seen him in. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, he's awesome. But yeah, so and speaking just back on that warehouse sequence uh, again. Um, I mean, I love the the tall grass, and the, he actually has shots of like the boys hiding within the grass. But then you still see the grass getting blown to bits by like the the bullet explosions that are going off. And yeah, and they have these awesome POV shots of the the guy. Like one specifically has this kind of like red dot sight and they do a pov of him trying to line it up with wherever the sniper window oh, yeah. is mike is like a yeah. sharpshooter with the fucking pistol dude he's wild yeah and then they do this really stylistic shot once the two guys sneak up and actually get into the warehouse before they take out the henchman and then interrogate the the sniper um he kind of like pops up and his shadow comes up and it shows like the gun and him holding it and then you actually see people Somebody gets shot, but it's not from the guy that's shown on screen with the shadow. It's actually someone off screen. And then two shadows come by when the two henchmen actually, or the two, uh, you know, the, out of the five, the the brotherhood, um, they show up. And it's just, it's a really cool sequence of, of events and shots um, that make up a good action scene. No, nah, well, and, and, and successful mission. That's yeah, it, man. It. They take out Nailed the sniper. It. And I was like, dude, movie's over. It's 60 minutes or so. We're done. You know, the, the boys mission. are in the restaurant. They're clinking the pints. They're getting their envelopes of money. The cash is being exchanged. Good job, everyone. It's done. But not yet. There's about 25 minutes left, and Frank is going to keep this game going, which is the the section that really clarifies the film, I think, because... Essentially, what happens is that um, Shin gets accused of having an affair at some point throughout the movie with Lung's wife, the boss's wife, and needs to be, you know, in classic, you know, you can't do that. You got, he needs to be disposed of. And so Curtis has been assigned assigned to handle the ritualistic punishment since this is a violation of the macho code between men and in, in this specific prese- uh, profession specifically. Um, but uh, Roy actually really resents this and she goes, well, you know, she tried to seduce all of us, you know, mm-hmm. which is a, a funny comment. Although when you actually go, the, uh, this, I think this is my second or third time watching the movie. When you do watch it again, the subtle clues are actually all there that the wife keeps coming in and being like, you know, saying hi to all the, the, the young, pretty bodyguards who are hanging around her house. There's that really extended sequence where um, uh, Shin has to like the car breaks down in the rain and he has to like fix the car. And then he come he comes in and says, you know, they were like, dude, we were trying to call you, but you were with the wife the whole day. Where, what were you doing? And he comes in soaking wet, taking his shirt off and they're telling him to shower. I was like, it's all there. It's in the hints, baby. Um and uh, but but uh, Roy goes, look, like, look, this guy's young. He's inexperienced and we're all friends and we're supposed to protect him. And so they face a kind of institutional contradiction that has been established by the movie, which is that honor and codes say that this kid must pointlessly die. Yeah. But also that his mentor and friends you know, are, are to protect him. It's what, it's what these guys do. They look out for each other. It's how they have survived. It's how they got the job done. 
you know and mm-hmm. so at first they're trying to figure out like how to get him on a boat out of hong kong uh mike at one point actually just contemplates shooting him just straight up and just being yeah. like because you know like like the other guys won't do this but i should do it because if you know if you just escape and the boss finds out that curtis and roy like let you go then they're gonna kill them it's you know it's it's you or us kind of deal but the friendship bonds that have been formed are too powerful and not one of them can execute the other person just because the the boss says so and briefly it's like the feel-good reversal of gonan yeah like no 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 they, characters getting picked off one by one it's every character going one by one i can't kill you i fucking it, love you man you know it's it's the polar opposite it's awesome it, yeah it, something else i want to note about what the boss wants is for the first chunk of the movie long is He's very much like, hey, look, we're all a family. Come drink my coffee. Do you want milk tea instead? Yes. Like, there's that great bit where he's It's a very important to, scene. He, he's trying to be like, hey, we're all friends here. They're all looking at him like, that's not what this is. You know, they're all very uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Um, but he, yeah. he almost appears non-threatening, strangely enough. Given, yeah. Besides well, the fact we all, all know that a bunch of people are trying to kill him. So they have their yeah. reasons, I'm sure. But just the, his, he does. Yeah. But, 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 but once again, it's the power dynamic in the position, yeah. right? It's like, no, yes. you're the boss. Yeah. You it, can't, it, it, you can't, yeah. you know, fucking light firecracker cigarettes and drink brewskis <laughs> by the pool with us. That's for us, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And it, what's, what's interesting is, I don't know if I misread it, but because, you know, you assume Lung is not a naive character, but you get a sense that he seems to actually want some sort of connection or he seems Mm -hmm, like he doesn't understand what the dynamics are as well as his employees do, Uh, which I guess is maybe not so much naivety as that's that can be a boss thing uh, as he just doesn't (laughs) get it. Uh, it well, that, to, that, with, that um, and they it's implied, right, that he was formerly it wasn't structured like that at one point. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I think it's Fat Chung who says that me and your dad like used to be or me and your boss like used to be equals or yeah. he's talking to Frank. So he says your brother, me yeah, and your brother yeah, used to be equals and we used to have and it's implied they used to yeah. have that kind of camaraderie and that kind of equal relationship. But again, now it's a feudal dynasty where one family rules the other families and that totally shifts the entire vibe and and. And also it shifts like what you need to be able to do, right? Like at, at a certain right. point, the boss needs to be able to be like, yeah, those guys just need to be eliminated. And yeah. it's easier to do that when they're well, not your friends, even if you want to be friends with them. Mm-hmm. What's fascinating, though, is Frank is the one who gives the order to eliminate Shin. Because uh, he says he he tells uh, Curtis like, hey, uh, the boss doesn't know this yet, but this is happening and you obviously need to deal with it. Yeah. Um, and so well, it's well, well, I, I think I think Frank views himself above them and he views like this as like Curtis's path to like moving back up and, and making yeah, his way up yeah. again. Well, it, you know, like the boss long has this romantic sort of idea of like, oh, yeah, I can I can sort of have a relationship with my employees or whatever. But Frank is, you know, he's very pragmatic. He's like, you work for us. This is what has to happen. The yeah. boss is y- your boss is not really going to get involved because it's the family business and I'm in the family and you're going to do what we need to do. Yeah. Uh, Cause yeah. I think Lung, unless I, I miss like, he basically disappears from the movie. Yeah. He it's does. All, it, well, and I think um, that's all part of the, the hierarchy too, is just the, it's the communication line. It's like, even if mm-hmm. Lung is making these decisions, you never see him make that decision. It's always, right. it's just going down the phone line until you get to it, the bottom. Um, because yeah, the big desperate. The act boss can the have distance is, when it's convenient, and he can have yes. closeness to them when it's when he convenient, wants it, right? When, yes. exactly. When when they need to take a bullet for him, damn right they're by the coffee maker when he's making yeah. coffee. Right. When 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 he's paid them and they've disrespected him and they need to be eliminated, well then you know he's a ghost. Yeah, it's giving just yeah. Frank, you death, do it. You know, yeah, Frank, you and, go and yeah. make the. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's another. I, it's a, it's another line or another layer that they can't get to, and he can keep going from layer to layer pretty much, and 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 there's no reason for him to not do it because he holds all the power. I would imagine that even on a small scale, if some of one of these guys did something really petty to him, like. Um, he would take it personally and do something about it, whether it be change yes. the hierarchy, whether it be kill them, who knows, but he'd do yeah. something about it because he has the power to do so. Yeah. It's fascinating that he, yeah, he, he has the power to make himself invisible, which is something that you take for granted after the first hour of the movie. It's like you're, 
everyone has to be with him at all times. And then <laughs> the climax of the movie is basically Roy, like, trying to find him. Like, it's like, I'm going to go and tell the boss, and he can't reach him. I mean, something yeah. else happens beforehand, but after a whole movie of, like, we're going to be around him all the time, it's like, now he's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you yeah. when you need him, he can't be there. And and it yeah. eventually, I mean, it shows the the ruthlessness of it all when, you know, they're trying to do kind of like a bargain. And then at a certain point, they even have James try to go to Lung. And he, you know, he's he's kind of just outside his, his place and he sees the uh, sister-in-law or Lung's wife. And um, and she just gets absolutely brutally murdered in the car that she that initially you think is going to be the car that she's going off to go to the club or whatever the hell she's doing that night. Um, and and it's, again, so coldly done. So when he looks at it, he's like, well, my favorite it's ca- detail is, is it's also done by two stone faced henchmen who have taken their employment positions where it's yeah, like those yeah. could have and just as easily been them where they're just anonymous dudes in suits who were hired by the boss to do a job. Yeah, and here they it, are just murdering his wife, which is when th- that's when the full reveal of the sort of the inherent sort of cold blooded ruthlessness of what being the boss in this kind of system is like, because James can't even conceive that that's something that he would do is he's like, no, no, no. And, and my favorite detail too, is that James is not just like going on behalf of the group. He's going like by himself because at, at this point in the film, uh, they've all agreed to like share like one last meal together where they're going to sort out this problem. They're going to enjoy each other's company. They're going to have some good food. And at the end of it, Curtis is going to fucking shoot Shin, you know, or Roy's going to shoot Curtis or something, you know, something along those lines is going to happen. They're in a, a sort of Mexican standoff situation. So James at one point is like, can I like leave to, I think he's to like to go to the bathroom or something. And I like, and like that's all or he's like, be here by like a certain time. Cause that's when it's going down. We're going to finish this meal and this, you know, this decision is going to get made. Um, and that's when he goes to decide to go for lung to beg for Shin's life. And yeah, just the, the pure, the, the shock of how such, what a brutal decision that was to just execute his wife for having an affair in an alley like that and how m- little care he must have about sparing any of them if that's how he yeah. treats his wife. He's like, that's you know? the thing. He was, he, I love, like, James's reaction is just basically, oh, I, like, th- there's no, w- nothing I could say to this man is going to make Even if we got save- to him... Shin dies, you know, like yeah, he's not going to say he's definitely not going to save the life of the youngest member that was just hired from the, for the Yakuza like a few weeks ago. It, it, it's it's like you're just absolutely screwed. And I do love the initial frustration that they have with Shin um, that we didn't really discuss too much, which is when they find him and they just start like screaming and smacking him around. And they're just like, how fucking dare you complicate things like this? We were at least mm-hmm. just chilling, dude. We were having beers after the hits. We, we were got killing paid. warehouses full of snipers. You we crossed the it. power line, baby. Yeah. Like. It's just, like, they just, they're so initially angry. But then I like that still, you know, it, it doesn't turn into that thing where they're so mad and now they're screwed. So they feel to kill him. They're like, all right, well you screwed up, but how do we get through this? And I do love that, that detail. Yeah. Um, Which I will say, I think the most genius thing about this finale, and it's something that Johnny toe has paid so much respect to in all of his movies is the focus on the codes and the rituals. Yeah. And there's something so spectacular about how he incorporates that into this finale. That's very clever and actually surprisingly kind of nice uh, for a movie like this that should have kind of a bleak ending. Yeah. But w- what what happens essentially is he has the characters go through the motions of the ritual of what the boss has asked for, which is that Curtis unload his gun into Shin. And and Curtis decides he's going to do this despite the fact that Roy, who is his superior and his friend, is knowing that Roy is probably going to shoot Curtis to death for doing it. And Curtis is, you know, he's, you know, that they're going to go through the motions and do that. And so you just see that moment when they all have guns pointed at each other and they're like, respect needs to be paid to this ritual. The rules need to be adhered to. This has to be played out despite any of our feelings about it. So Curtis unloads his gun into Shin brutally, supposedly, apparently. (laughs) And then Roy unloads his gun into not Curtis, but the restaurant because he can't Curtis is his friend. He can't kill his friend. And it's such a sad moment because in that moment, Roy absolutely thinks Shin is dead and he can't even kill Curtis even after that moment because he's just that true of a friend with him. 
And then it's revealed that Curtis fired blanks so that Shin yeah. can escape through the back alley back door. And it's so genius because the idea is that the workers found a way to go through the motions of the ritual that was of, of what the job was. And to satisfy everyone who was watching, all the, the lung guys outside who were paying attention to the scenario, they heard enough. The bullets went off. People yep. killed each other. It went down. And but, but they found a way to stage that while also subverting it and disobeying the boss and bending the routine in order in the name of friendship, man, because yep. they fucking love each other. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, it, and it almost makes you it almost makes you feel bad about having that that second guess that they would have killed Shin because it's so brutal and and aggressive like the way he does the it's like time's up grabs the gun and just caps him now you almost think that that coldness is a hint maybe that it, he wouldn't have done it like that if he were to do it it probably would have been a more you know remorseful act but um, we've seen anthony but, wong do some brutal shit right like the way exactly. he cut that guy's throat and we so know, and we just know that this is the lifestyle where it's like if i don't kill you this guy's gonna brutally kill me it's just the way it goes so you just you kind of you know you believe it that um but then when it when the reveal happens that it's like no look and james or curtis gives james the blank to reveal that you know that wasn't the case and then you get shin out in the alleyway you know just totally alive you're like why would i second guess my best friends in the world come on now these are the dudes these are the bros yeah the, the only thing that makes you sad in retrospect is that just the wife died yeah <laughs> it's like she gets pretty the, the wife probably, cast, you know <laughs> I gotta say. <laughs> that is r.i.p to the wife for she, sure she she got a raw deal on that one you know the guys the guy i mean Wish but she, she also i guess homies, wasn't you know? wasn't wasn't in the hangout scenes wasn't quite no. dudes rocking i guess i know i don't know they they, they didn't include her in the plan unfortunately it's it's a bummer that her girlfriends didn't pull through somehow some some weird elaborate plan it's a bummer but yeah but yeah oh. great ending but it is great and and again it has that like it's a very upbeat song that that comes up when it's fading to black as shin leaves the alley alive and um, you know, you're just, again, you're just with, with all the harrowing things that do happen, you're, you're, I, I just couldn't believe I'm like, I shouldn't have second guessed this at all. This is a good time. This is meant to be a good time for the most part. Um, I love, yeah, I love this movie. Well, pivoting, uh, towards maybe the reductive rating round on this one. This is a very, honestly, this is a very high four for me. I really, really love this movie and I have a feeling that I'm going to keep, I'm going to go through some more Johnny toe and I'm going to come back, but this, maybe this ends up being one of my favorite Johnny toes. And part of the, I mean, it's, it's helpful when a filmmaker, this skilled makes their hangout movie because it's the movie you find yourself typically wanting to return back to and wanting to be like, I just like the atmosphere of hanging out with these guys, with these actors doing doing this um this uh th this work with them and there's something so cool about making such a casual and kind of what feels like a little bit of a lighter hangout movie inside of what is otherwise a cold-blooded kind of mercenary milieu and kind of the the movie that you would normally see far more destructive and melodramatic choices being made by an actor or by a filmmaker which is um you know again Part and parcel for Johnny, too, who is, you know, working on much tighter budgets on much shorter uh, shooting schedules and uh, is is, you know, functionally making Hong Kong B movies. But he's just making them, uh, you know, so carefully and so artfully and finding so much in both the unconventional kind of. Uh, action and shootout style that he ends up kind of pulling with the just the, all the formal focus on waiting and anticipation and geometry and stillness like again there's a sculpture like tableau quality to it that's just so in, in, incredible even if it is convenient for him uh, that that he's not doing any crazy John Woo shit. Um, but then, yeah, mixing that with the, you know, bleak reality of what is the boss's relationship to his employees in the context of the brutal underworld. And mm -hmm. I've always loved that that's something that he pays so much attention to in every single one of his crime and gangster films, that someone has power over someone else and what they do with that and how they hide the ruthlessness of it underneath tradition or rituals or codes in the way of like ancient warriors or, you know, like there's, there's a, there's a certain level of respect here and the way that he just 
just always takes that material and he's like witnesses how the decisions made at the top there, especially the greedy ones, the way they just trickle down to the ground level laborers who do the kind of unglamorous bidding, which in, in the case of all of these five guys is uh, really well depicted by all the actors and all their playful romantic camaraderie of kicking paper balls around and drinking beers by the pool, putting firecrackers in each other's cigarettes and just having a general really, really good time and realizing that while having a good time that, uh, yeah, that, that, that it, it's almost there, there's a class based critique that's inherent to that because they're like man i relate way more to these guys despite Mm -hmm. the fact that we are in a horrible occupation and we're all expendable and we could get shot in any second and a tense fucking sniper fight could break out at any second we survive it because you know we this is this is our world and we're skilled at it and we're you know we're best friends while we're doing it so if you're looking for a 90 minute like a hong kong gangster movie and it, it, it's tense and it's efficient and it's precise and it's stripped down almost to like a ritualized purity. And it's got that sense of cool guys in suits and sunglasses. And it's got that oh, yeah. economy that, that you're looking for of these dudes having, you know, being cool and having feelings for one another. You're going to get all of that. But you're also going to get a very, very unconventional working class hangout movie uh, at, at the same time that is has critiques uh, based on class and has really, really fun vibes and an incredible uh, score that I uh, am going to listen to right when we wrap up. So, yeah, very strong for for me. Nice. Yeah, me too. I, I think this is fantastic. I'm, I'm a huge Johnny uh, Toe fan and I, I got to just check out more of his stuff. I think I've only seen five of his movies. Um, and like you said, Josh, there's so many. So I really got to start going down the rabbit hole. But I think he has such an understanding of, of power dynamics and and how, you know, kind of each group would interact with each other because of those dynamics. Um and I like, you know, just speaking on Lung's character, having him actually wanting to kind of connect in a way that he can't is very interesting. And, um, and, but, but at the same time, when it's happening, they probably feel this kind of pressure to at least try because he is also the boss and they don't want him to do anything to them. So there's just all, I think Toe has this understanding of that that I think a lot of other directors I haven't, uh, I haven't seen from so I, I think it's it's great like I mean election has a lot of it although that is just like purely the higher ups uh, kind of one upping each other a lot of the time but throw down um, I think that was the one that you and I watched Josh together um, mm-hmm. has that has that friendship aspect of it that's very strong that you see a lot of in this in this movie and I th- that is I think that's my favorite uh, Johnny mode is when he's just like hyper focused on the, the the friendships and the relationships. I think he's so good at it. Um, yeah, you could even say the same of the heroic trio, all those uh, lady uh, superheroes. Yeah, you know, I gotta together, see that one. Hanging out. That's that. That sounds awesome. Um, so yeah, I think I, I I'm, I'm a huge fan. Uh, you know, dudes rock, friends forever. I think the uh, the humor's great. Um, incredible action too, without being overbearing or anything or or like not overbearing, but overly chaotic. I think he has an incredible control that still feels like very exciting with the squib work and, and, and everything. But he has a, a good sense of like having you understand the geography of, of whatever shootout is going on. So yeah, just great stuff. Uh, strong four. Yeah. For you, Perry. Uh, I'm also going to go with the strong four uh, for many of the same reasons you discussed. I just find it, uh, I mean, it's a movie that we were able to talk about as long as, or if not longer than its runtime, I think. <laughs> uh, we're a little bit under, actually. We're doing pretty oh, good. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. well. Yeah, based on we, my timer we, here, but anyone at home can double check. <laughs> we, we, we approached its runtime uh, just talking about essentially only the character dynamics. Like, the character yeah. dynamics in this movie are There's so hardly good. a plot. There's hardly yeah. a plot. Like. It, it doesn't need one, you know? Um, it's just such a such a strong crime drama. Uh, it was really a joy to revisit this one after so many years. Yeah. Uh, and I also want to add real quick for wrapping up, uh, we've talked about the main uh, music motif in the movie, mm-hmm. which is very video gamey. But I want to talk about all the action scenes have a different musical motif, which is also very, very video gamey, but it's like... 
I don't know, Final Fantasy VII battle theme or something. Yeah, I was gonna say it's, oh, just, it's sure. just more like tense battle yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, that, I don't know, those two tracks are really, or I guess those two motifs are really all you need for a great soundtrack, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Hell yeah, so if you haven't uh, if you haven't checked out The Mission or Johnny Toe, we recommend doing so. Um, but that, I think, is going to wrap it up for um, this week's episode uh, that was once again Gonin from 1995 and the Mission from 1999. Thanks so much, Perry, for uh, once again joining us uh, for for your annual spot and for bringing some some uh, killer movies as always. What's uh, do you do? You got anything coming up in Perry World you can talk about yet? Are you working on anything? Yeah. Um, well, you can always check my website perryrulin.com to see uh, what I've been publishing recently. I, I write short fiction, uh, mostly horror fiction. And uh, all new updates go there. Uh, let's see. I just had a story come out in the last issue of the great journal Fasterium. And I have a story coming out in the journal Weird Horror soon, which is a very gothic and strange story. And um, I don't know if I can say much more yet, but there should be some more stories on the way this year. Hell yeah. Go check him out and go, go check out uh, his, his previous books as well. All kinds of and, and and short films, Sun Gazer. I know we've talked about that one on the show. Go 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 rent it, or is it available for people to watch? It's, a, it's, it's available still on for Vimeo, free right? on Vimeo. Yeah, free on Vimeo. Go yeah. check out his short film. I I one I guess more specific plug because I figure it's probably smart. Um, if you like the sort of mix of uh, crime and grotesque horror that we discussed uh, in Gonin. Uh, one of my stories called The Box Inside and Out is free to read online and it is very much in that uh, genre space. Hell yeah. Awesome. So check it out for sure. Uh, for our listeners, we are going to be back in one week's time uh, where we are going to be, as Jamie alluded to, uh, we're going to be talking about some Westerns and some sci-fi at the same time. We're going to be doing a pairing of uh, High Noon, the classic Gary Cooper Western that many uh, dads everywhere are familiar and love and watch on TV every Sunday. And we're going to be pairing it with a film that is probably equally as beloved by dads because it stars Sean Connery and is basically the space remake of it. We're going to be talking about Outland directed by Peter Hyams, which has some of that great uh, tactile post alien kind of like dirty sci-fi production design that I've always been a big fan of. So yeah, me too. we're going to be talking about that in a, a one week's time over on the Patreon feed next week. But then in two weeks time, there is a remake of a little movie called roadhouse coming oh, out. Yeah. And uh, we have never talked about roadhouse. So we are going to be talking about the, the, the original Patrick Swayze roadhouse film which i'm very excited uh to talk about because it has one of the hardest lines of dialogue uh ever <laughs> written for like a macho 80s you know <laughs> sort of like action melodrama style film which is i used to fuck guys like you in prison uh, i can't wait to what a talk about that for a character <laughs> Yeah, with our with our our guest in two weeks, and we're we're going to be pairing that with a, a, a film that a lot of people actually compared Roadhouse to when it originally came out, and will kind of put us back into our exploitation roots because we've been having fun doing like some Burt Reynolds in the seventies, some Henry Silva in the seventies. We're going to talk about Walking Tall, starring Joe <laughs> Don Baker. So we're going to be talking big dudes, and they're I, I think in Walking Tall he's got a big stick. Hell yeah. He's gonna beat some guys with a stick. He's Let's gonna, go. you know, put put an end to countywide corruption the same way that uh, Patrick Swayze is gonna say, protect the bar and uh, yes. stop all the. Are they are they a car dealership family? I'm forgetting what type I've, of evil rich person they are. And that I just remember <laughs> I there being remember a monster either. truck. <laughs> <laughs> I just, That's I just the detail I remember. Discover, yeah. Yeah, so Walking Tall and Roadhouse. That's going to be our pairing in two weeks' time, so look forward to that. Beautiful. But uh, yeah, that being said, that wraps it up for everything this week. Thanks so much for listening, and keep it sleazy. Keep it sleazy, everybody.